Good morning, everyone. So I think that we can begin the second day of our conference. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Monika Rakowska, who is the director of the Doctoral School of uh, Humanistic Sciences uh, at the University of Warsaw to, uh, to welcome everyone at, the, at this beautiful place. Um, hello, good morning, um, dear all. It is my great honor and joy to welcome you at the University of Warsaw, university where the study of antiquity and its traditions dates back uh, to its beginning or last for over 200 years. Today, with special respect and gratitude, I welcome our honored guest, whose contribution to the field of antiquity and tradition of antiquity uh, studies is priceless. So, Professor Maria Hansen from the University of Copenhagen, uh, Professor uh, Gabriela Cianciolo from the University of Cologne, Dr. Juliette Harrison, uh, Newman University, and Astrid Linsen, uh, sorry for my uh, German, um, Staatliche Kunst Sammlungen Dresden. So your presence uh, underscores the value uh, of cooperation and exchange of ideas, and it is constant inspiration for young researchers the older one as well, but especially for young researchers, on whose initiative the second edition uh, of the Echoes of Antiquity conference was organized. And at this point, I must to thank you, Monika Dunajko and Michał Kuźmiński, uh, who are the organizers. And I must say that as the director of the school, uh, of humanities, I'm really impressed and I'm proud of them. So, thank you. I'm warm I warmly welcome everyone who declared the interest on the tradition of ancient art in medieval, modern and contemporary culture. The scope, a variety of contributions to be presented, show how vivid are the studies on uh, on the reception of antiquity in post-antique culture, city landscapes, architecture, art, literature, etc. I'm happy that we can meet in Warsaw. Uh, even though Poland uh, was not a direct heir of Mediterranean culture in the material sphere, like countries that once lay within the borders of the Wo Roman Empire, Studies on the legacy of antiquity in Polish culture have a long history and a rich literature. For the Poles, the classical heritage constitutes an important aspect of their European cultural identity, or at least an indication of expressing and searching for this cultural identity. The interest in the Greek and Roman antiquities was present in Poland since the Middle Ages. However, a special development of its interest began in the second half of 18th century. At that time, the interest in Greek and Roman antiquities became particularly intense. Of key importance were the journeys undertaken by the Polish travelers mainly to Italy but also to other regions uh, as Turkey or Greece or France, the collection of antiquities, antique-like artifacts and plaster cast of ancient art, uh, finally uh, Jardin à l'Antique. Um, and in 19th century, um, despite the obvious political obstacles to the development of Polish culture and science, knowledge 
of classical antiquity spread thanks to the opening of public museums, housing artifacts, and the inclusion of studies in the program of university education, referring to Greco-Roman works of art and craftsmanship. The research was conducted on the manner of transfer of ancient models and their diffusion in Poland, as well as the special role that artists and their affluent patrons played in this process. As I mentioned, at the University of Warsaw, the studies of an ancient culture and its reception dates back to the 19th century and the collection of plaster casts, which is the, the subject of Monica doctoral thesis, is the best proof of this. Since then, research has grown significantly through the work of uh, various researchers, archaeologists, historian, and art historian. Today, I'm glad to see young researchers for whom this is still an important field of research and I really appreciate their enthusiasm and personal, uh, professional skills. I must, as I must say that I'm also an archaeologist of Roman uh, archaeology, but um, with some focus of tradition of ancient art as well. Uh, my primary of Polish travelers uh, uh, in, in pursuit of antiquity. So uh, I personally um, uh, appreciate, appreciate uh, this uh, continuation of the, um, of the studies of tradition of ancient art. Once again, I warmly welcome you all. Today, uh, we will travel to Rome, where it all began, and to other European countries, including Sweden and Estonia. And I'm delighted that we can share this experience together. I firmly believe that today's session will yield fruitful outcomes and open new horizon for all in attendance. So let's enjoy this day together. Thank you. Hello everyone, I would like to, oh, sorry, <laughs> once again, uh, hello everyone, I would like to welcome you to the second day of our conference on behalf of the Pałat Saski company, and I would like to uh, cordially invite you to a small sightseeing tour at the end of uh, the conference today, which will start at 4 p.m., uh, we are going to show you the excavation site of the Saski Palace, the Saxon Palace, which is just a five minutes walk from here. And it's, it's a site of the uh, palace, which used to be a residence of the royal uh, Saxon uh, monarchy. And our company is tasked with rebuilding the, the palace in its neoclassical form, which it had just before uh, World War II when it was destroyed. And at the same time, it is my pleasure to also invite you to read the call for papers for our conference in September, uh, which you had uh, received in your folders uh, yesterday. Uh, it's called Rebuilding What Was Lost, current challenges in restoring and reconstructing architectural heritage. And the event is organized by the Palat Saski Company, but together with the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. And our conference partners are also Association of Polish Architects and National Institute of for M Monument Conservation. <coughs> Sorry, <laughs> didn't take my water. And uh, I would like to highlight some of the topics which will be discussed during the conference because I believe that uh, it might be of interest to you uh, to explore the social perception of 
uh, currently reconstructed buildings and the question of historical architecture in contemporary urban setting and its impact on the society. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now I think we can begin the first session. And um, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Małgorzata Gromczewska, who is the deputy director at the uh, Łazienki Royal Museum, and she's going to be the, uh, to, to chair this uh, session. So good morning, everyone. I know that you were guests yesterday in our museum. I hope you had a great day. And today we start the second part. Um, and first, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Gabriela Cianciolo from University of Cologne. Uh, Gabriela is a professor of architecture history at the University of Köln uh, at the Department of um, Kunsthistorische so Art History. She graduated in 1999 from the University of Palermo and went to obtain her PhD in History of Architecture and Preservation of Architectural Heritage in 2004. Um, she has received a lot of grants <laughs> and fellowship from Italian German international institution, including German Academic Exchange Service, Alexander for Humboldt Foundation and uh, Biblioteca Herziana from, for the most important one. From 2014 to 2017, she, has as she was an assistant professor at the uh, Technische Universität München at, uh, and responsible for a research project founded by the German Research Foundation. Between 2015 and 19, she has coordinated a cross-disciplinary research project on Pompeii, founded by the uh, Franz Hofer Society and the Max Planck Society, based at the Histori Kunsthistorische Institute in Florence. And currently, she is leading an EU project, very interesting subject, graffiti art in prison. And today, uh, Professor Gabriela Cianciolo will speak about architecture metabolism, echoes of Pompeii in 19th century iron structures. Please take the floor. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thank you also for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here, sad to have missed yesterday's session and uh, thank you again for the organization. I can confirm that it was a great uh, organization of the whole conference and the program is very exciting. I'm glad to participate. I open uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, so this is uh, what I'm going to talk about, architectural metabolism. I will explain a little bit the concept and about the echoes of Pompeii in iron structures. So the ancient world has shaped our mm, current world, our cities, and uh, we are sometimes aware, sometimes not aware that we are surrounded by infinite echoes, variations, and evocations of ancient, and I will look at especially Pompeian models, Pompeian themes. For example, here I see also in this room Pompeian echoes, but uh, in our uh, cities, like from the small scale of the porcelain to the lamps in the urban um, decor, or the balconies in Moscow, uh, the street lamps in Florence, or here the um, fountains in Turin, the theaters in Stockholm, the libraries in Copenhagen. All of these buildings and elements are, have a strong influence uh, from Pompeii. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, the traces that Pompeii left on the work of 19th century architects and uh, um, artist, and that they in turn left on our cities. Um, so this is what we see today. Uh, Pompeii, uh, the idea is that Pompeii exists not only in its materiality on site and in countless collections, museums worldwide, 
uh, but also in many adaptations and reinterpretations from painting to furniture, from architecture to urban design. And in particular, wall paintings with their brilliant colors, precious details, details, spectacular scenographic effects, and architectural elements in infinite combination and variations uh, aroused the curiosity of many designers in the 19th century, especially who conferred a tectonic function to these uh, painted schemes uh, and created a new light, airy, dematerialized iron style. So this is the specific form of the dialogue with the ancient city I'm interested in. Uh, so my presentation is about the interaction between Pompeian wall paintings and 19th century architectural design and discourse, uh, with a special focus on iron construction and its aesthetic. My point basically is that the painted architectures, or architectures of the Roman world, like this one, uh, inspired 19th century iron constructions. Basically, in this drawing, in this uh, chromolithography, I see iron structures, and this is what architects in the 19th century saw too. And uh, on the other side, in 19th century iron buildings, I started to recognize Pompeii. This is the process. Um, and this topic has never been really addressed, either from the perspective of Pompeian studies or from the perspective of architectural history. So this was a gap I tried to bridge. Uh, in other words, the history of iron architecture has ignored Pompeian studies. This is the point of departure of my investigation, this project uh, that um, was just mentioned. Um, I cannot explain about what uh, this project was about. It's, it's the, the three main topics were history of restoration of Pompeii, history of musealization and reception. My uh, topic is uh, basically one of the aspects of the reception. And the initi initial idea for uh, the subject came from a very simple observation, merely basic quantitative data. So I explored various archives in Europe, in um, France, Germany, England, and I found an impressive amount of architects' drawings, like those that you see here, um, of uh, basically watercolors of Pompeian murals, depicting Pompeian murals. And these drawings um, aroused my interest and I started to investigate and to ask why did so many architects um, passionately engaged with these fictional painted structures uh, in these, all these drawings and paintings. So really hundreds of those. And uh, these questions have never been addressed, even though the interaction between the pictorial arts, the mural paintings, and the architecture has been widely investigated. One of the big topics uh, is that uh, these paintings uh, were adapted in many European interiors, um, like mm, so many ways in which the domestic uh, interiors of European houses uh, have this wonderful um, emulation or adaptation of Pompeian interiors, like mm, Aschaffenburg in Germany, the Pompeianum, or this is Monaco, so there are many different ways of interpreting these uh, mural paintings. But the, um, the discussion has been limited to uh, basically to the surface, um, we can say, uh, to issues of taste, fashion, polychromy, and iconography. And uh, I jumped to another uh, level, mm, probably because of my um, study. I am an architect, so I was a practi practitioner architect. So I started to read uh, beyond the surface, so more in a structural way. So I w and I started to, uh, to see in these surfaces something three-dimensional. So from the, um, iron from the mural painting to the iron structure, like, like in this uh, building. So the point is that Pompe in, uh, in these Pompeian uh, mural paintings, architects learned how to use exposed iron structures aesthetically 
and how to work with the new materials, the new proportions, and the new special effects. This is one of the examples. Henri Labrust is the architect. is one of the most famous European architects of the 19th century, and especially known, fa especially famous for using uh, these exposed iron structures in his wonderful libraries in Paris, which are among the most beautiful spaces in Paris. And uh, Labrust's debt to Pompeii is a question that often emerges in the literature, but was never addressed in depth. So uh, among many other architects, Labrust produced a remarkable number of drawings depicting Pompeian murals such as these beautiful watercolors. Um, and uh, these drawings are evidence of his engagement with Pompeii and also that for him and for many other architects, these painted structures were at least as important as the real physical ruins, so in the quantity of, of the drawings. And also in the accuracy and the emphasis on, uh, on color. Uh, what do these drawings reveal? I started to ask myself what, why so many beautiful drawings like this? Um, polychromy, beca because the polychromy debate was one of the most important theoretical and also practical discussions for architects in the 19th century. But the interest was certainly not limited to issues of chromaticism, like this sketches by Labrust show clearly. These are ink drawings made in the Naples Museum depicting details of Pompeian murals, like sketched. And here clearly he's looking for, not for color, not for chromaticism, not for paintings, but for something else which is structural elements, which is material elements. So, and other, there are others, uh, sketches by Labrust. And uh, by means of some examples, I will illustrate the way in which this painted architecture stimulated both the theoretical reflection and the practical applications in a transfer process that I call metabolism, uh, using a concept uh, by Gottfried Semper. I will explain briefly. And this process showed the vitality of Pompeii as a source of inspiration and also the creative response of architects that uh, when confronted with this um, uh, heritage from antiquity. So uh, I uh, left aside the B-dimensional, the two-dimensional repetition of the painted schemes and will focus just on the transposition of these motifs into three-dimensional structures and to the me this metabolic process. You probably don't see Pompeii in these rooms, but I do, and you will at the end of this presentation. <laughs> uh, these are Labrust libraries. So I uh, organized the presentation in three parts. Uh, I kindly ask Michal to give me a sign when I have five minutes left so that I jump to the conclusion in case. Hmm? Yes. So I just organized the presentation in three uh, mm, parts and I briefly address uh, these three uh, topics, architectural metabolism, Gottfried Semper and the stoff vexel theory, architecture and new materials, the iron problem and the solution, Pompeian arabesques, wall paintings and 19th century architects. Um, Gottfried Semper, the most important architectural theorist of the 19th century, introduced the term metabolism into architectural discourse in his first volume of uh, Der Stil in 1860. Uh, the German word Stoff, Stoffwechsel means both material change and metabolism and implies the idea of transformation. In the case of architecture, uh, refers to the transfer of forms and structure from one material to another. And uh, this um, word, of course, comes from biology, uh, where it refers to this chemical exchange uh, in nature, in the organism, natural organism. And Semper used this mm, concept to explain a phenomenon that was interpreted, has been interpreted in the history of architecture since its beginnings for centuries, the transfer 
of forms and motifs from one material to another. And uh, this theory, sh this Stoff-Wechsel theory is uh, fundamental in central reflection. And I just explained through one example, it's not uh, easy, but I try to give at least one example. In the four elemente der Baukunst, the four elements of architecture, um, in this uh, study from 1851, um, uh, Semper identifies four main elements, which are the center of the building, the core, the hearth, the roof, the funda foundation or platform, and the enclosure, the wall. And the Semper describes the wall not as something load-bearing, but in its primitive original form, as uh, in the archetypal form, as something made of textile. So he imagines a transition happening across the centuries uh, in history of architecture from the textile wall, which, was, which is the primitive form, to the stone wall, to the painted wall. And uh, for him, Pompeian um, paintings were very important because they represented the evidence of the Bekleidung, so the um, clothing of architecture, and of this metabolism, of this change from textile to stone and then to painted. Um, so these um, temporary structures, movable partitions between the rooms, became in a second stage walls, stone walls, so through a process which he calls ossification, using a geological metaphor. And then the materiality changed gradually, so from fabric into stone and then into paint. And the painted mm, uh, architectures of Pompeii were for him very important to explain these processes. Uh, and the, all these translations, modification, and metabolic processes are cornerstones of Semper aesthetic art and understanding. Um, also because this changed the uh, traditional hierarchy in um, between structure and ornament, because for him, ornament is more important than structure. The second element uh, here is the problem, the iron problem and uh, the new materials. So I use this notion of metabolism Mm, of this uh, change from an artistic motive to another, from a material to another, to describe this uh, phenomenon of transmediality. So this transfer of motives from one medium, fresco painting, to another, iron construction, iron structure. And uh, uh, cast iron was introduced in the 19th century, a bit earlier actually, uh, after the Industrial Revolution, and this offered to architects um, incredible new um, opportunities. So many uh, structures became suddenly possible, and um, they offered uh, an entirely new, uh, new uh, material with different static uh, performances. And um, this was the moment, and this was a problem, as Barry Bergdahl s explains in this um, chapter about the European architecture in this period, the iron problem. Why was iron a problem? Because architects didn't know how to use it aesthetically. They uh, needed a reference that missed at, they missed at that time. They had a reference for stone architecture, but not for iron architecture, so they were at the first, the beginning, um, a bit um, insecure how to work with this new material. Anyway, after millennia of masonry buildings, iron radically changed architecture's constructural methods and architectural proportion. Uh, so iron claimed a different style or a different physiognomy and required a new um, artistic expression, a new uh, style. And this is uh, why it was a problem. Here uh, you have an, uh, an example of how many new possibilities, also from the point of view of the typology, um, for example, also um, many temporary buildings, new functional buildings like uh, bridges, uh, marks, marks 
markets, train station, arcades, pavilions, exhibition halls. All these are new architecture, new uh, typologies shared, the new taste for aerial light forms and the need for ornamentation. And at the same time, the emergence of Pompeian motifs in countless domestic interiors, publications, uh, so these motifs became uh, very popular and at the same time where iron was appearing and these parallel developments entered a new phase when architects and engineers became aware not only of the potential of iron but also of the potential of Pompeii for their purposes. Uh, so, and most of the studies of the 19th century iron architecture don't take uh, Pompeii into account at all. So they just refer to Gothic architecture or to a generic Oriental architecture as a stylistic um, model to for new uh, cast iron architectural production. And Pompeii is not even mentioned. But actually architects were thinking a lot about Pompeii, for example, Godfrey Semper, was convinced that uh, I have a quotation from these Vorlochige Bemerkungen from, uh, from 1834 about the mm, painted architecture and uh, sculpture of the ancient time. And he says basically that also in antiquity, architects used uh, wood, iron, and bronze for their architecture. So he was convinced that in Pompeii architects represented in the walls what they really used to build. So he said Pompeian wall paintings in red clearly show that this light painted architecture is derives from the, the real iron structures. So they existed. And what happened, I jump very quickly. I f it was a long process for me to understand that and to find the evidence, because at the beginning it was just an intuition, but I didn't have any proof, so I couldn't really say that. When I was working in the archives of the Royal Institute of British Architects in London, I found this drawing on the left, which struck my attention. It was a Pompeian interior, like many other, but you see in the foregr foreground, you see the column detached from the wall with the shadow. And uh, I was uh, impressed. I didn't know the architect. He's not famous. But I said, so he is visualizing the project, the process I am trying to describe, like the column detaching from the wall. And uh, I started to research with his name, and I found this article, and I celebrated after finding this article, because it was the evidence that the architects immediately connected these mural paintings with their new possibility with iron. And th this is the article that won a gold medal of the Institute of British Architects in 1842, because he said effects which should result to architectural taste with regard to arrangements and design from the general introduction of iron in the construction of buildings. So it was clear. and. This is uh, not Pompeii, but Rome. Anyway, I found after that many other confirmations uh, written, not only design. Like for example, uh, he says that this architecture that the ancient perpetuated on the walls has a uniformity and a consistency which entitled this composition to be considered an organized style, a style of architecture of extreme tenuity which is the most obvious effect to be produced by the formation of a genuine style adapted to the use of cast iron without losing sight of the precedence afforded by antiquity. And this was another problem that they needed also the confirmation of the ancient to, to do that. They were not modern architects that can build in iron without decoration, without aesthetical reference. And then many other architects argue, I found other, like in, uh, for example, in uh, Italian publication, 1901, Melani wrote 
the belief, I translate uh, from Italian, the belief that uh, iron cannot produce artistic buildings is an archaic prejudice. And to those who see in the application of such a material nothing but the skeleton of an architectural work, and to iron they deny the plasticity necessary to an artistic material, one might open the eyes of these late com comers by asking them whether the Hellenistic frescoes, frescoes of Pompeii could not inspire an architecture of iron such as they desire. The light arches, the slender columns, the Pompeian candelabra seem created on purpose to second the muse of modern architects who would like to apply iron and do not know what form to impart to it. Uh, seeing nothing in the monuments of the past that could be useful to monuments of the present. So this is what they basically see in these paintings. And this is the candelabra style, what he mentions. So the candelabra were these painted elements in the paintings. Uh, there is a style called candelabra style in the mural paintings, but uh, there are also the real candelabra, those that were very successful and uh, also reproduced in publication, exposed in museum. So they had both the painted and the bronze evidence of this style. And they, uh, this is a picture from the, in the basement of the museum in Naples, there are hundreds of those candelabra, uh, not uh, exhibited, but the architects were in the 19th century were aware of these elements. And they imagine a new world of buildings made with the new aesthetic of iron. And this is another book uh, by Canina, so Domestic Architecture from Ancient Paintings of Pompeii. And this is what happens. They imagine a new architectural order. Stone is left, the classical, the traditional, and iron on the right. Columns, different columns from the painted buildings of Pompeii. So they imagine a new architectural order. The one last point I want to uh, just briefly address is the topic and the, the term arabesque, because this is crucial, very important. Um, arabesque is an all-encompassing term used as a major category of ornament in philosophy, psychology, literature, arts, and architecture during the 19th century. Uh, but was used as a synonymous for um, uh, with an ancient and Renaissance mural painting. And Catremer uh, de Quincy uh, writes in his um, dictionnaire, dictionnaire that uh, paintings were so common in Pompeii that the city can be said to be entirely painted. They are in the taste of composition that we now call arabesque and against which Vitruvius spoke out. Uh, so here there are two important elements. So the perception of Pompeii as a painted city and also that Vitruvius was against those paintings. And uh, this is a prejudice that recurs. This is a Zant publication, also mm, first decades of the 19th century, a huge, wonderful uh, in folio publication with chromo lithographs of Pompeian paintings. So the popularity of these, of these uh, murals were, was huge. Yeah. And uh, also there was, there was a, on the other side, a kind of resistance. There was a prejudice that we find in every uh, statement about these paintings in the 19th century that this style was capricious, was, um, it generally pleases, but if not absolutely vulgar, it oftentimes approached vulgarity, like Owen Jones uh, writes, states in his Grammar of Ornaments. And the problem was that Vitruvius uh, was uh, conde condemned these, these uh, painted uh, structures called them monstrosities. This is the translation of Vitruvius, seventh book. He said, these images which were modeled on reality are now condemned in the light of current depraved taste. Now monstrosities rather than faithful representation are painted in frescoes. So for him, mm, these 
um, structures are impossible, deceptive, depraved, and monstrous. And there is a huge literature about that, why he calls these uh, structures monstrous. And, and mon monsters are not in the sense we uh, understand them today, but anyway, I don't go so far to uh, enter in this discussion. But there was, on the one hand, a strong fascination, on the other hand, a big taboo. Uh, so the, these uh, architects were obsessed uh, with these paintings, but at the same time, there was a shadow. And this shadow was, on the one hand, the criti criticism uh, by Vitruvius, but not only that. F there was something else, and uh, there was also a strong censorship because of the um, sexuality exhibited in those uh, murals that was, of course, somehow uh, for the time very embarrassing, and maybe today too, but uh, that all these erotic subjects were like could not enter into the category of beauty and taste. And this is something that I also found in the architects' uh, journals, magazines. They wrote, okay, let's say it clearly in, in relation to Pompeii, uh, the depravity of the Pompeians as illustrated by the frescoes cannot, why we don't talk openly about it? They show this corruption of imperial Rome so that Sodoma and Gomorrah were pure compared with Pompeii. So there was another big taboo. But in the end, um, they, uh, the architects decided we don't care about Vitruvius, we just ignore the, his authorship because we need these, uh, these models. And he says, Pointer, the architect uh, he, I mentioned at the beginning, there is another side of the question with this, which these great, great authorities like Vitruvius seem to have overlooked. If we examine the ancient arabesque independently of these prejudices, we shall find endless beauty, variety and originality, graceful details combined in consistent and ingenious motives and analogies and great skills and freedom in the mode of expression. So they start to use these models regardless of the criticism and the prejudices. This is a real lift in an exhibition, and it clearly has Pompeian um, paintings as a model. And also here we see Pompeii not only in the gardens painted, but also in the structure, and also the arabesque are deco decorative elements in iron. Uh, so basically the architects didn't care anymore, and they started to use these surrealistic, impossible paintings for their use. They needed it. And uh, gave a tectonic function to these illusionistic architecture of the third and fourth Pompeian styles. And I want to conclude, it seems appropriate to conclude with uh, an inversion, which shows the reverse process I, I, I described up, up to now, um, in the 80s, the Neapolitan painter Ettore de Maria Bel Bergler decorated the walls of the summer hall in the Villa Malfitano in Palermo with a trompe l'oeil fresco depicting a greenhouse with large windows opening onto a garden with exotic plants. The structure of the greenhouse, which looks uh, onto a blue sky filled with birds, is made up of slender columns reproducing so painted real cast iron supports that at that time existed with rich decoration in arabesque motifs. So the arabesque is back to the wall, again painted bidimensional. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Cianciolo to show us the new face of uh, iron architecture and this research of beauty in using new materials, uh, which is still the subject with new materials that we discover now in architecture and design. And now I will ask Dr. Christopher Landstedt from Instituto Suedese di Studi Classici a Roma to present a paper about references to antiquity in 19th century Swedish ceremonies as festivities arranged by the Royal Cart. 
Dr. Landstedt uh, is uh, holds a PhD in art history from Stockholm University, uh, when where he presented this dissertation about festivities, places, and visual culture in Stockholm during the Gustavian era. Um, well, I give you the floor. Thank you so much, and thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me or uh, accepting my proposal and paper, and uh, also thanks for a very, very uh, well-organized conference. It's been absolutely a pleasure. Thanks to the previous speakers for the great presentations these two days. Dear colleagues, here we go. This presentation will examine how the use of references to antiquity in general and Rome in particular in Swedish court affiliated festivities changed during the 18th century. By outlining the broader circumstances and highlighting two specific cases, as well as investigating the importance of King Gustav III's almost year-long travel to Italy. I aim to show how antiquity became increasingly more significant in festivities and court culture. In a Swedish context, the architect Nicodemus de Sinde Younger was a forerunner in the visual representation of ceremonies, victory festivities, and public celebrations. We can see one example over here. The festivities given to celebrate the victory at the Battle of Narva in November 1700 during the Great Northern War was one of the best opportunities presented to the scene, where he was allowed to show the knowledge and skills he had acquired during his educational tours in foremost Italy and France. A 25-meter high pyramid decorated with inscriptions in Latin reminiscent of Roman victories and containing about 2,000 500 lights was among the most remarkable ephemeral architectural creations. It both showed the nation's political ambitions as well as being an example where antiquity played an essential role in the visual representation during this kind of event. The outcome of the war itself was devastating and it put a strain on the country's finances which affected a majority of construction and art projects, as well as any sort of lavish public entertainment. A both financially and politically weakened monarchy during the reign of Frederick I and Adolphus Frederick meant that limitations were still current throughout their reigns. A noticeable change occurred when Gustav III came to power. On the 19th of August, 1772, Gustav III made a successful coup d'etat or revolution, as he himself called it. By strengthening the monarchy and his own power, it simultaneously became possible for the crown to control and portray all public festivities, more or less. And we will start with the first example, the Feast of Diana, which took place in the Drottningholm Palace Garden in August 1778. Uh, the type of uh, festivity was a divertisement. You can simplify if I call it a Gesamtkunstwerk. The divertisement, the celebration of Diana, or the Feast of Diana, was performed in honor of Queen Sofia Magdalena in August 1778. The king had had an enclosure made for a till yard near the Chinese pavilion in the Drottingholm Palace Garden. A temporary architecture had been built at the current Flores Hill, where a spectator stand, a running track, and painted scenery on the hill to the right, representing the Temple of Diana. The goddess herself is surrounded by her nymphs and ladies-in-waiting in front of a tent on the opposite, uh, opposite side. To each side of the tent, there is a place for spectators and an orchestra. A quadrille of fawns armed with clubs had just arrived. They declare the love for the goddess of the chase and her followers, and they wish to marry the followers. They wish to show themselves worthy of this honor through their skill at jousting. The leader of the fawns, Nessus, played by Duke Charles, can be seen on horseback riding uh, the gallop and wearing a, quote, savage custom, end quote, with a boar's head transfixed on his lance. 
The forms, however, are vanquished by the hunters, captained by Meleager, played by Gaster the Third, who is accompanied by his companion in arms, the fair Atalanta, played by Countess Eleonora Wilhelmina from Höcken. Duchess Hedwig Elisabeth Carlotta herself took part of the took the part of Diana, and she records that what caused a stir at this divertisement was the sight or quote, the sight of a woman on a horseback taking part in the contest and like Amazons riding like men, end quote. In companion, uh, in a companion piece to this painting, Per Hillestrand portrayed the hunter's quadrille. The festivities ended with a large illumination and feast in a bosquet called the star. You can see the other quadrille over here. The celebration of Diana was a mixture of a divertisement and a carousel. The event can be categorized in a popular tradition of a European court festivities culture, where carousels were a manifestation of the current regime with an emphasis on its relations to antiquity, its rural rulers, tradition, myths, and use of symbols. A few examples are the Parisian Carousel of 1662 during the reign of Louis XIV, the Dresden Carousel, uh, of 1709, hosted by the Polish monarch Augustus II, and the Berlin Carousel in 1750, organized by Gustav III's uncle, Frederick II, or Frederick the Great of Prussia. The impact of the latter can be traced to the graphic and written descriptions Frederick's sister, Queen Louise Ulrike of Sweden, received, since she was unable to participate herself. Among these items are 36 watercolors, showing costumes and characters from the carousel. And here we see the probably best preserved dress or custom, uh, the so-called savage attire worn by Duke Charles. And now I will move on to Gustav I's journey to Italy in 1783 to 1784. An injured arm in need of healing paved the way for, Gustav the for a grand tour-like travel to Italy in 1783. A group of about 20 noblemen and servants accompanied Gustav III, who traveled as the Count of Haga on what was officially a healing expedition to the warm baths of Pisa. After the king's arm was cured, the company continued to Florence, Rome, and Naples. Thanks to diaries, letters, and reports, what the companion explored and thought of what he saw is well documented. The king enjoyed opportunities to the Vatican collections, court life, and cultural explorations. Pope Pius VI, showing the brand new Museo Pio Clementino, did not only pave the way for Augusta I's Museum of Antiquities, the Royal Museum, and furthermore, the National Museum in Stockholm, but also presented possibilities of a well thought out way to incorporate antiquity in more aspects of visual culture. The Swedish monarch and his companions were also well received by Ferdinand I and Queen Maria Carolina, sister of both Emperor Joseph II and Queen Marie Antoinette of France. The importance of the visit to Pompeii and Herculaneum, which took place during this part of the journey, cannot be stressed enough in regard to the subject matter. And now I will move on to the second and last example of festivities in comparison to the first one after the travel to Italy. And this is the masquerade in the King's Garden or the illuminated uh, masquerade in the King's Garden. On August 21st, 1791, an illumination and art or masquerade was held in King's Garden in Stockholm. The event was organized by the burghers of Stockholm with the permission of Gustav III, who had recently returned from another health trip, this time to Aachen. The king can be considered the real but unofficial uh, client, while the burghers of Stockholm played the role of the financer and practical coordinator in the planning and execution of the event. The festivities were free to attend and was advertised in several newspapers. Approximately 10 10,000 participants, almost 15% of the city's population, attended the party. The participants were free to dress up and wear masks and many shoes to do so. 
The orangery was transformed into a ballroom and decorated with arcades and pilasters in style reminiscent of the Vatican lodges and was illuminated with approximately 5,000 lights and marshals, which can be seen here on, on the painting. It can stay there for a while. The facade and the building was... Uh, Mm, sorry, uh, at the entrance of the orangery, there was a main inscription with four illuminated columns and sculptures of Roman divinities. In, partic in particular, Clementia, a clear nod to the cult under Julius Caesar, played a key role in the narrative of the evening. Further, the central lot had an illumination of the king's name shifter between the divinities. Besides the illuminated masquerade, a commemorative medal for the king's return to the country was also founded by the burghers of Stockholm. The top of the helmet features a two-part plume. Plumes of this type, though, were not common in parade, were common in parades and ceremonies, but not in battles. The plumes are attached to a sphinx placed at the center of the helmet, which refers to Mars' altar, the avenger of Mars. With a Latin inscription emphasizing the king's role as civis princeps, the links to Rome became even clearer. To reinforce the official explanation for the ocean trip and uh, conceal its actual proceedings, the significance of visual art was emphasized. Niklas Latrens and Younger was commissioned by Gustav III to create a painting that connected the Swedish-Russian war between 1788 and 1790, the stay in Aachen, and the illuminated masquerade in the King's Garden. Um, the painting depicts the crown prince making a sacrifice to Hygeia. The painting's narrative follows and supports the symbolic language of the medal and the illuminated masquerade with details such as a bust of Gustav III, portrait as an emperor with a laurel wreath placed on a rostrata column, then you also have a tripod, a Campania-like landscape, and a temple building itself. And finally, some conclusions and remarks. In the early reign of Gustav III, the immediate relationship to antiquity was more evident in literature and history. The visual usage of symbols, signs, and cults of personality were often filtered through a common understanding of European court culture. The celebration or feast of Diana is foremost to be considered a part of early modern court carousel tradition rather than anything else. The travel in Italy 1783 to 1784 marks a clear difference in how festivities and celebrations were visually presented when it comes to the role of antiquity. Particularly the stay in Naples, the kingdom of the two Sicilies, Sicilies and Rome, the papal state, offered examples on how to incorporate the classical tradition in a contemporary setting. The acquired knowledge and the mastery on how to effectively place oneself among the noticeable characters of antiquity became evident in the case of the masquerading king's garden, where both the main theme of the evening or the narrative, as well as the visual culture produced in conjunction to the festivity, revolved around the classical world. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> For us, especially, it's especially interesting because Gustavus III is contemporary of Saint of August, so we can find a lot of um, common, common heritage. Um, now we will come back to Pompeii with uh, the speech of Dr. Janika Anderson from the University of Tartu Museum in Estonia. Dr. Anderson uh, is the director of research at the University of Tartu Museum. Her research interests are the reception of Asian art, the history of university collections, and methods of uh, implement, implementing the collection in teaching process. She received her PhD in classical philology, philology in 2020, 2015, sorry, and so she will talk today about echoes of Pompeii murals in Estonia. Please welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and um, fifteen minutes, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, 
And um, I use the floor here, and uh, they thank you especially for Gabriella um, Cianciolo for this uh, absolutely wonderful introduction, the Pompeian style and uh, material. And uh, I'm uh, talking about the Pompeian murals in Estonia. Uh, uh, from 18th century, the Asian cities Pompeii, Herculanum, and her surrounding areas have been excavated, and the cotton world has opened uh, to people se step by step. Today, the number of artifacts from the Paris cities and are preserved in sites and museums, and visualization of large numbers of excavated objects were published in uh, books uh, or uh, as sheets of prints immediately after discoveries. Rediscovered Roman interior design fascinated people to its um, colorful murals. Pompeian style wall paintings came to fashion and um, enjoyed big uh, popularity from the second half uh, of the 18th century to the first half of the 19th uh, century and continued to be even in vogue uh, in the early 20th century. The presentation focuses on the findings of uh, paintings of Pompeian style interiors. A um, couple of manor houses, uh, Vanabudu Manor House and Surekopu Manor House in, uh, in Estonia, and the public interior of the University of Sarchi Museum. Uh, Estonia was during the 19th century under the Russian Empire, uh, uh, and uh, it situ uh, situates quite far from the heart of the Europe and, uh, and uh, southern of Europe. Uh, but it was influenced by the interior decor uh, discovered in Asian cities um, as well. Uh, there are, uh, the University of Tartu Art Museum uh, was uh, academic interior, interior and uh, manor houses were uh, privately owned. And uh, there are different ways to uh, quote the inspiration uh, for uh, interior, de uh, interior um, decor in that time. It was. Uh, uh, polychromic lithographic sheets and of course also traveling um, in uh, Italy and uh, in Central Europe uh, and also in St. Petersburg uh, where they uh, could see uh, different uh, examples. Uh, the Pompeian style of all paintings in University of Tartu Art Museum were completed 1868 as we can found uh, a signature of uh, the Mm, painter uh, uh, behind the, the, uh, our um, uh, heating uh, uh, place uh, was discovered and uh, these paintings were made uh, uh, under the direction of Ludwig Schwabe who was, who was professor of classical philology in that time in the university and later continued uh, teaching uh, classical archaeology and uh, art history also in Tübingen University in Germany. Um, and uh, these interior were specially designed uh, and made uh, for the museum. It, uh, it's a first um, specially made for uh, made interior for uh, museum in Estonia uh, because art museum was opened already in uh, one um, in 1803 uh, when university was reopened and um, the Pompeian style wall paintings were specially. Uh, mean to exhibit white plaster casts uh, to get a more ancient um, feeling in, in the rooms. And uh, these um, murals are meant to be uh, like educational purpose uh, because uh, these follow very exactly um, uh, Wilhelm Zahn uh, publication uh, uh, sheets, engravings. Every hall, we have seven uh, colorful halls in museum, have a special uh, uh, example um, uh, sheet. The model um, of uh, the red hall is painted after the Casa del Boeta uh, Dragico. Uh, the green hall uh, is made after House uh, of Mercadanti in Pompeii. Uh, and uh, our wonderful uh, blue hall uh, has followed the Casa della Vestali in Pompeii. And uh, dark red uh, and green hall, and uh, also the nice uh, and very small black room has followed uh, uh, Casa di Bro Bronze in Pompeii. And we have also yellow room uh, that is also um, uh, got uh, its example from, um, from Pompeii. 
but um, the, uh, my other case studies coming from the private houses, and uh, these are um, appropriations of the Mural, Pompeian, and Hercul Herculaneum uh, findings. Uh, the first one is a Suregupu Manor. The house was built uh, in the middle of the 19th century, and uh, the Pompeian wall paintings uh, were a little bit uh, made a little bit later, maybe in 1860s. Uh, uh, and um, this uh, house of family Strick uh, in Suregupu. Mm, uh, followed uh, the example of uh, Cicero's house. Uh, the wall paintings were discovered uh, in Estonia in 2003 uh, by the conservators and were fully rebuilt uh, in 2006 under the layers of paint and enchanting Pompeian style black and red interior was gradually revealed and three figurative scenes with the uh, kentaurs have survived in their entirety. The mythological scenes depicting uh, kentaurs um, uh, are, are copies of paintings from the dining room of uh, Villa Cicero. Uh, and um, the originals were excavated uh, and removed uh, from the villa in uh, 1749. Since that time, they have been stored in National Archaeological Museum of Naples. Uh, <coughs> and uh, these paintings have inspired many 18th and 19th century artists who produced numerous black and white and colored uh, lithographic sheets. Uh, the models of uh, Surakop art is supposed to come from Wilhelm Zahn colorful uh, albums. Uh, in Villa Cicero, as well in um, Surakopu Manor, the scenes where kentaurs have a black background, but figures of kentaurs in Surakopu are significantly larger than the originals in Villa Cicero. It is possible that uh, von Strick, the owner of Manor House, or the painter, had not actually seen the original paintings, or he preferred consciously to present the kentaurs more dominantly in the Manor's representative uh, room to increase uh, spectacularity. Um, the overall composition uh, with the architectural uh, articulation uh, carotid between the window, marble Corinthian order, dividing the panels, painted uh, dental molding that creates an optical spatial effect, and the imitation craning of the ceiling comes from the artist's own imagination. Uh, the artistic quality of work suggests that it uh, could not have been executed by local master. This is also suggested by the hypothetical self-portraits of the artist you can see uh, on the marbling, uh, marble space um, uh, on the wall. Uh, <coughs> but uh, in uh, 2016, it uh, was carried out uh, uh, in one way to manner to identify the original decoration under the posterior paint layers uh, in dining room. Maybe it's interesting to say that these post-manor houses in Suragopu and in Vanavedu were used as uh, school houses. Uh, that's why uh, the houses are quite well preserved and uh, because they have been used uh, all the in use all the time. So this uh, covered murals copy the typical Asian fall diagrams, a lower part of the fall in the bottom zone uh, large dark colored panels in central zone and colorful painting figural compositions in upper zone at top of windows and uh, doors. Eight figural uh, scenes uh, with animals uh, are placed into triangular uh, frontons, uh, motifs with birds and insects, a pigeon holding a little parrot with a basket uh, of treasure, a cat catching a bird, and four fields uh, depicting carrier driven by different uh, creatures, such as butterfly and the beetle. Uh, by contrast, compared with the Dadu and panels, the figurative paintings uh, in the zone of the frieze are unexpectedly well preserved. The fauna is uh, painted with such great sensitivity and accuracy that identification of individual um, species is, impo uh, is uh, possible in some cases. One of the most complete and best preserved motifs depicting a parrot, a carrier of grasshopper, is a top eastern door of the mural of, um, of the Vanavuidu, the parrot is pulling the carrot 
uh, while uh, the grasshopper is a carrier tear. An example of uh, mm, motifs uh, found uh, 1745 in Herculaneum. Uh, it was detached, removed, and exhibited in the Naples National Archaeolog Archaeological Museum, but it, uh, as, uh, as much I know, it um, no longer exists. The motif of the painting was published uh, as an engraving uh, Mm, uh, this text, uh, for the first time, 12 years after excavation, the engraving uh, is of high quality and accompanied, uh, accompanying text, but uh, the book lacks of information on the context, such as uh, would be expected today's archaeological uh, work. Uh, and, and in this case, it is, uh, it is possible that copy of Vanavedo is the only existing uh, uh, color reproduction of the motif. Only black and white images have been preserved by the engravings in early publication. Uh, therefore, we don't know the original colors of the figurative painting. Uh, as Romans enjoyed uh, teaching their pets uh, tricks, uh, mm, however, image preserved in lava from uh, ancient Herculaneum depicting a miniature chariot drawn by parrots and driven by grasshopper was originally meant as a satire. Uh, for example, the stronger being uh, driven by the weaker it has been uh, said that this uh, referred to influence that Seneca had over uh, Nero. And uh, there are several more motifs uh, in this house uh, that are published in different uh, publications. And uh, the originals are mainly, mainly uh, preserved in uh, Naples Archaeological uh, Museum. Uh, but um, uh, we can say uh, that um, uh, the choice of uh, the motifs in this house is quite unclear. Uh, uh, these are not exact copies, uh, just uh, fragments of uh, wall paintings, and uh, maybe it's uh, just imagination of painter or, or uh, wish of owner to have something nice uh, in um, their uh, home house. So, when we, we speak about copying of ancient art, including Pompeian interior design, we should keep in mind that even copy is not normally completely identical with the original work of art. Difference can lie in the material, technique, integrity, size, style, as well as uh, in the details. Um, uh, in the details of art. At the same time, the meaning of the original artwork can change or disappear in the process. In private manner, figurative motifs are taken from the ancient models, and these are united and combined, probably, probably according to the vision of the masters and customer. In Suragopu manner, figural motifs of um, uh, Kent Towers um, uh, are used in large multiple multiple times compared with the originals in Villa Cicero, making colorful in the interiors um, in this private um, uh, house and attracting maybe uh, quests of the owner. Murals in Vanavedo Manor has much more enigmatic. There are numerous figurative paintings uh, joined delicately in the dining room. In the current state uh, of the research is probably a mystery how and why the choice of motives uh, was made. It can be like a jerk uh, for a viewer who is trying to find allegory behind the pictures instead of uh, enjoying the truthfulness of the animal and birds. Uh, and in, in the academic interior of the University of Tartu, the lithographic, um, polychromy lithographic sheets uh, are the models that reflect the full wall of ancient house uh, and almost uh, uh, strictly refer to the original paintings. Uh, the purpose of murals of academic interior is rather educational than creative uh, appropriation of uh, ancient material. And to conclude, uh, these examples are important in the context of reception of appropriation of ancient art in Estonian visual culture. Undoubtedly, these are um, interesting and unique examples uh, in um, our interior design, which try to imitate ancient world uh, quite far from um, the heart of uh, this painting's uh, original place, but also express the desire to follow the trends of the 19th century uh, Europe. Thank you.
Thank you so much. It makes us thinking that this um, inspiration was larger than we probably thought in Europe. Um, now we will uh, listen uh, a presentation of Dr. Wojciech Brilowski from the University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznan. Uh, Dr. Brilowski is a classical archaeologist and art historian educated at the Nikolaus Copernicus University in Torun and he currently em is employed as an assistant professor at the University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznan. His research interest includes the archaeology and history of art of the Hellenistic and Roman imperial periods as well as the history of Asian and modern art collecting and he's, as I understood, an active archaeologist as well. And today, Mrs. Mr. Berlowski will speak about the beginning and development of the gem collecting by Prince Stanisław Poniatowski. Oh, okay, thank you very much. I just a short moment because I have a, a small problem with my presentation. Uh, I don't know why this uh, touchpad is sort of crazy. Now, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, possibility to take part of this uh, seminar. I'd like to uh, discuss today the question of uh, a gem engraving, that was, uh, which is uh, quite often overseen. Uh, in the 18th and the early 19th century, it was considered to be one of the major uh, arts. And as such, it uh, was the one of the main points of its interest for connoisseurs, uh, mm, collectors, and uh, art patrons as well. And among them, one of the greatest and the most important was uh, for certain Prince uh, Stanisław Poniatowski, the nephew of the last King of Poland, Stanisław August. And uh, uh, he, his uh, mm, importance in this uh, area is well recognized, but uh, mainly uh, in relation to his uh, later period of collecting, uh, I mean uh, 1820s and 1830s, when he amassed a huge amount of uh, engraved uh, gems, mainly in Taglios, but also some cameos, uh, more than uh, 2,600 of uh, stones, and uh, main parts of them, uh, 1,700, were uh, inscribed with the artist's signatures. And after he died, uh, six, la uh, six years later after he died, uh, this collection was put on sale in uh, uh, Christie's in London. And uh, it came out that it, to a major degree, was composed of uh, stones that uh, at that time already were considered to be uh, fakes. Uh, fakes, and um, almost all the signatures uh, were also uh, recognized as false. So there was this a huge. Uh, it caused a huge decline in the uh, interest of uh, gem engraving uh, to a degree that until very uh, today it's still con uh, considered to be one of these uh, less uh, important uh, um, branches of art of neoclassical period. And uh, mm, even if this state of uh, it's changing for the la it uh, has been changing for the last 25 years or so. Now, uh, here we have uh, uh, four examples of so-called Poniatowski gems. Uh, these uh, neoclassical ones that uh, were uh, put on sale as uh, antiquities, and uh, now they are kept in the British Museum. Uh, from the uh, 20th uh, century, from the first half of 20th century. And we can see the uh, bozzetto for a portrait by uh, Angelika Kaufmann, 
where we can see the prince in the uniform of a, of a, a general of the royal guard. And he sat for this portrait in, a, in a 1785, and it was finished uh, in January of uh, 1786. Now, uh, this uh, decline and crisis in the interest of uh, gem collecting uh, sort of uh, caused uh, uh, a criticism of, uh, of a prince collecting too. And uh, one of the major things put on uh, by the specialists in this field already in the, in the 19th century w was that uh, actually the beginning of his gem collecting were uh, due to the gift or inheritance of a gem collection of uh, the Polish king, uh, his uh, uncle. Even if this idea that does not have uh, support in the sources, and uh, it started already in the 1830s, and I think that actually it was uh, related to these uh, sorts of voices among specialists that uh, even before sale, that this collection is full of fakes. And uh, the um, uh, prince's sons and, uh, and the House of Christie's, they tried to, to put this theory of uh, inheritance from the uh, last king of Poland, the famous for his uh, taste and the art collecting in general, uh, as a, a sort of uh, rehabilitation of the uh, prince collection and uh, proof that it, in fact his gems were uh, genuine. And uh, I show these two portraits. Uh, this one to the right is the one of the recent uh, uh, paintings that were uh, bought by the royal uh, castle uh, in Warsaw. It's, uh, it, is, it is my theory that it could be the August Frederick Moszynski, the, fr the friend of uh, King Stanislaw August and the um, famous art collector and uh, a sort of creator for the uh, King's collection in the 1770s and 1780s. Uh, and uh, I show those two portraits that to show that uh, indeed those two persons were uh, a sort of involved in this uh, early education of Prince Stanisław Poniatowski and uh, they could uh, actually uh, kindle the interest in the gems in the young prince. And uh, it must be underlined that King was to the major degree the responsible for the young prince education and for the uh, several decades he considered him to be uh, a heir to the throne of Poland, which of course uh, was impossible after the uh, constitution of the 3rd of May 1791. Now, uh, we it was uh, in his memoirs written in the 1830s that Prince uh, has, had written that he was interested in the uh, gems and engraved gems from early childhood. It can be proven, uh, it can't be proven, but uh, we already know that in the 1780s, while about 30 years old, he uh, mm, already started uh, gem collecting. The earliest sources are from the mid 1780s. And among them, there are those two uh, journals, uh, di uh, diaries of uh, travels into German countries and into Italy, the second travel in Italy. For the first time, he was there in 1775 uh, until 1776. And in those two uh, journals, he mentions, uh, he discusses uh, gems. Uh, he mentions uh, that he bought some of the, the stones and uh, he uh, describes the major collection he has seen. For example, the Stosch collection in Berlin, which he didn't like very much. Now, uh, uh, here, uh, the original portrait where is, uh, was badly damaged during the First World War, so I show those two uh, early copies uh, that are very interesting for the subject because here the prince is presented with this, a sort of souvenir of his second travel to Italy, to, uh, to Sicily to be exact, 
and the Etna in the background. But what is most important is the, the, those two seals that he, uh, he kept uh, mm, uh, along, uh, attached to his belt. Uh, that actually we can see those two engraved gems uh, used by, uh, by him as a seals and the ornament alike. Of course, it's not an uh, uncommon thing uh, for the models uh, to start for the portraits uh, showing the uh, gems. Now, uh, we know that already in the 1770s, during the, uh, his first, uh, first uh, journey to Italy, he met William Hamilton and probably his uh, nephew, Charles uh, Greville. And both of them were famous for the art interest and art collecting, and both of them possessed a collection of uh, engraved gems. And uh, especially William Hamilton, but also Charles Greville, were, uh, were interested in mineralogy uh, as well. I mean, the general uh, the science of uh, min uh, mineralogy, same as a uh, in Prince Stanisław Poniatowski, it was already noted in 1778 that he possessed in his library the Treaty of Hamilton on uh, Volcanoes. Now, uh, so it shows that Prince was involved in, uh, in the, mm, the highest uh, level uh, mm, connoisseurs of uh, ancient art from uh, Great Britain, uh, living or visiting Italy at the time. Uh, here we, okay, we can again see the Char Charles Greville. It's the one in the background in this uh, brown uh, overcoat. And again, he is also shown here uh, in this uh, painting originally by jo Joshua Re Reynolds, the one to the right. And why I put on s such m so much stress on Charles Greville? Because it's now it's, become, uh, it's becoming obvious that Prince Stanisław Poniatowski uh, both uh, uh, his, uh, I mean, the Greville's collection of engraved gems uh, uh, in mid 1780s, uh, up to uh, uh, possibly up to uh, 1790s, early 1790s. And uh, another uh, British uh, connoisseur of gems uh, of that time, the, uh, the most famous one was uh, Richard Worsley. And he was uh, sort of involved in the, in the business uh, in selling the, the gems of uh, Hamilton and Greville to the British Museum and other uh, uh, art collectors. Among them, I suppose, Prince uh, Stanisław Poniatowski. And uh, those two persons are ve very important. Uh, notorious uh, faker and art seller Thomas Jenkins, seen to the left, and the more serious person, the uh, famous uh, connoisseur Ennio Quirino Visconti, and both of them uh, had very close relationship, and both of them uh, had some contacts in 1780s and 1790s with the Prince Stanisław Poniatowski. And actually, here we uh, can see uh, the, the set of casts taken by Tommaso Cades, the famous uh, game and graver and cast maker. Uh, that already in the 1790s started to take casts from the Prince Stanisław Poniatowski collection uh, that was originally accompanied by a catalog written, handwritten catalog written by Ennio Quirino Visconti, already mentioned. Now, uh, for the long time it was uh, a common thing among the scholars to put stress that uh, actually Prince Stanisław Poniatowski, because of his uh, involvement of faking uh, gems, uh, kept them in secret and uh, didn't uh, allow the scholars to uh, the, the access to the collection, which uh, is a, a historical uh, historiographical myth because we can trace that both Cades and Paoletti, famous for the uh, game casts, uh, took uh, imprints from the Prince collection in 1780s. Now, and we can trace uh, the history of some of the ma uh, major gems uh, mentioned, some of them already in 1780s and 1790s, along the uh, 
50 years of Princess Gem collecting, and some of them are now kept in the major museums of the world. And uh, indeed, it shows that some of them uh, are really genuine antiques. And uh, here we can see the publication, the major publication from the 1830s, uh, the two catalogues of uh, one composed by the prince himself to the left and the catalogue of, uh, of the sale. And uh, among the lists, we can recognize at least a uh, hundred gems that were already uh, in his possession in 1780s and 90s. But what is uh, important for us, especially when we discuss the echoes of antiquity, is the fact that uh, about 1816, 1817, Prince uh, um, started the major program of uh, um, patronizing the modern M uh, gem engravers uh, in order to make his uh, collection more uh, co comprehensive. Uh, so he ordered, just two minutes, yeah. uh, he ordered um, mainly from the two kind of subjects. Uh, one, uh, mm, the subjects from uh, ancient poetry, uh, most of all epics by Homer and uh, Vergil, and the second uh, category were portraits. Both of them were scarcely represented in his earlier collection. Now, and uh, still, it's the mystery unsolved. Why, at a certain point, he uh, decided that those uh, gems should be uh, mm, inscribed with these false signatures of ancient artists. Uh, he discussed this. Uh, he uh, sort of presents himself, uh, himself in this 1830s uh, catalog as a major patron of gem engraving, and he actually compared the level of the crafts uh, between the ancient and the modern ones, and he uh, put the stress on the need for encouraging the modern artists to, uh, to follow the footsteps of the ancient ones because they, are, uh, they present a very similar level to the ancient counterparts and uh, uh, there is they, they can be easily uh, mm, get into the rivalry of the uh, predecessors. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bilowski. So I have a lot of questions to your All right. presentation. <laughs> a lot of subjects, including value, uh, authenticity, false, yeah, uh, yeah. changing of these categories and practices. Mm -hmm. But now we have a uh, few minutes, or even more than a few minutes, for uh, take a coffee, a little break. Uh, we should meet here at 11.20, and I think uh, we'll have enough time to speak a bit and uh, refresh. So, see you in uh, 35 minutes.
So we should start the second part of this panel. And we will start uh, by a presentation by PH candidate from University of Warsaw, Mr. Arkadiusz Cegliński. Uh, Mr. Cegliński is graduated from Faculty of Archaeology at the University in Warsaw and PH candidate in Doctoral School of Humanities. He is specialist in museums and uh, uh, his work, yeah, specialist in Museum and Institute of Zoology of Polish Academy of Science. And his interests uh, are mainly classical archaeology, reception of antiquity, and Warsaw in 19, 18th and 19th centuries. I'm, I'm very pleased because he will ask about my place of work. And the subject of his speech will be the legacy of antiquity, Greco Roman inspiration in the Royal Łazienki Park gardens in Warsaw. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today I would like to tell you a few words about the uh, reception of antique in the uh, Royal Łazienki uh, Park during the uh, s second half of the 18th century, during the time of its creation. I want to tell you about the sources of inspirations because uh, before we can tell why, we, can, we have to uh, tell uh, where it come from. So yesterday, uh, we were in a very important place for the history of palace and garden complexes in Poland. Uh, one of the most important landscape uh, gardens in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, founded by uh, King Stanislas August, Łazienki uh, Królewskie, which means uh, Royal Baths. Uh, a romantic garden uh, in the English style, uh, filled with motifs uh, referring to the culture of ancient Greece and Rome. A royal Łazienki belonged to a group of residences founded in uh, the second half of the 18th uh, century in or near Warsaw. Warsaw as the uh, developing city, again playing an important political and economic uh, role, uh, thanks to the election of Stanislas August in 1764 and the end of Saxon dynasty. Uh, it was the place where the most uh, important uh, magnate families established their estates. Uh, the second half of the 18th uh, century was a time of intensive development of suburban residences in uh, Warsaw. Magnate families uh, such as Poniatowski, Lubomirski and Czartoryski decided to establish their estates near Warsaw in the form of a palace and garden complex. Uh, in, other words, uh, in other words, landscape residence. Uh, this was influenced by classicist and enlightenment uh, influences coming from the West, which spread strongly in uh, Poland from the 1760s. Uh, establishing landscape uh, residence in Poland was a form of Polish elites, uh, fitting into the European trend of funding this type of private uh, estates. Gardens primar uh, primarily uh, English and French, uh, for example, uh, stove uh, in Great Britain or uh, Petit Trianon, which you see on the slide, uh, were a source of inspiration for Polish investors. Uh, these were romantic gardens uh, closely related to the nature, often of the rural uh, character. They were distinguished by a departure of, uh, from the axial baroque layouts uh, and their uh, regular plans. Picturesque irregular uh, spaces, rains, ponds, meadows, uh, forests, elements as close to, as possible to na nature, seemingly untouched by human hands. Uh, the fashion for uh, establishing residence with a landscape uh, garden in Europe resulted from, among the others, uh, a renewed interest in unshared uh, art and culture. This was influenced by great archaeological discoveries uh, in such places as Pompeii, Herculanum, Baalbek, Palmyra, Pestum, and Rome. Uh, the uh, mania of antiquity, collecting everything which is ancient, translated into development of classic, uh, classicist architecture. 
The modern residen residences referred to places such as Tivoli, the imperial palaces on the Palatine Hill, the Musaurea, or the villa of the Pliny the Younger uh, in Laurentum. Well, Royal Łazienki is an 18th century summer residence of Stanislav August, which history dates back to the 17th century when Stanislav Heraklius Lubomirski founded his garden pavilion uh, for hunting with the baths and the uh, hermitage. The pavilion designed uh, by, the, by Tillman of Gameren was taken over by Stanislav August uh, along with the Ujazdów castle in the 1764. The king started uh, work on the Łazienki in uh, 1767 and from the 1762 the scope of the works increased significantly. Within almost 30 years from the uh, 67 to the uh, 1795 when, uh, uh, when the, uh, there was an abdication of the king, uh, a splendid uh, landscape residence with elements of Baroque and French uh, garden was built there. A very important char characteristic of the royal uh, estate were countless, uh, countless uh, references uh, in a decoration, in the architecture, in the ideological program uh, to the ancient tradition. Uh, the king, uh, who spent several years abroad before his coronation, being able to admire the English and or French uh, palace and garden complexes, translated his experience and observations into the design of uh, his own residence. In addition, he was a great admirer of Italy, although he had never been there. Uh, he was also interested in ancient art. Uh, he sent his, his artists and uh, agents uh, to Italy, Greece, and other countries where they could study ancient art. Uh, Franciszek Smuglewicz, August Frederick Moszyński, and Jan Christian Kamzetel should be mentioned here. Uh, on the slide, you see the plan of uh, Łazienki from the uh, 80s uh, of uh, 18th uh, century. And here you can see the photo of Łazienki from the last year. Uh, due to the limited time, I want to show you only a few examples from the uh, Royal Łazienki, the examples of the reception of antiquity in the residence uh, from the second half of the 18th century. The most uh, important and central building is in Łazienki is uh, Palace on Dairu, when uh, where you had the opportunity to be there yesterday. Uh, you can find many references to antiquity, uh, antiquity, uh, antiquity uh, in it. For example, uh, in the ballroom, uh, you, on the chimneys, you saw the uh, copies of uh, famous sculptures, Apollo Belvedere and uh, Hercules Farnese. But I would like to uh, tell you a few words about the uh, wall decoration. Uh, the wall paintings uh, show grotesques uh, made in the 1790s by Jan Bogumil Plecz. Uh, he was a court painter of the king. Uh, they are showing uh, the four seasons and uh, four elements. Grotesques were a very popular motif in Europe of classicism. Uh, such representation, for example, can be found in the Hermitage in uh, St. Uh, Petersburg. Uh, the grotesques in Łazienki uh, were partly inspired by paintings in Rafael, Rafael's Loggia in the Vatican. Uh, they were popularized uh, by engravings of Giovanni Ottaviani in the 18th uh, century. Rafael, inspired by the grotesques found, founded in the ruins of Nero's Domus Aurea, the, uh, did a wonderful uh, job in the Apostolic Palace. But it was really Rafael who uh, was the only source of the uh, inspiration for Stanislas August and uh, his artists. As I mentioned, uh, the king sent his, uh, his people all over Europe for educational purposes. Yes, especially in terms of exploring art. In the 70s, Franciszek Smuglewicz 
uh, one of the scholarship holders participated in archaeological works in, at Domus Aurea, the, during which he was responsible for drawing documentation. Uh, at first, that uh, th they thought these, are, these were the terms of Titus, but it turned out uh, that they were ruins of the famous Golden Palace of Nero. It is very likely that this was uh, one of the main sources of inspiration for the paintings in the ballroom. Ancient inspirations uh, in Wazienki were contained not only in the interiors, but uh, also in the architecture. A great inspiration for the uh, era of classicism was the Via Appia, one of the Roman uh, roads along uh, which the ancient Romans buried, buried they deaths and uh, erecting magnificent tombs and mausoleums for them. Uh, it was the place uh, that was willingly documented uh, among uh, the others by uh, uh, Giovanni Battista Piranesi in the 18th century. Um, referring to Piranesi, it was the king Stanislas August who willingly collected his engravings and works. In, in addition, he maintained contact with his son, Francesco, which we know from the preserved correspondence between the gentlemen. Uh, opposite the theater uh, on the water, there was an old corde guard, a guard box, uh, which was built on a square plan in the form of pyramid covered with turf. It was like um, ancient tumulus. Uh, the no longer, the no longer uh, existing uh, structure still lies as a barely excavated ruin, uh, referred to the tombs uh, covered with uh, soil located on Via Appia. It was a one-room building with two entrances with a pediment. In the ar archives, uh, uh, in, in the inventory of Wazienki from the 1795, I found uh, a little uh, sign, uh, signature. It, it should be like mausoleum. Mm. Okay. Uh, another interesting building uh, was the theater on the uh, water, and there is, of course, uh, located near the palace on the isle. The theater with a stage of, on the island, uh, which still exists today, is an artificial ruin which probably refers to the ancient cities of Levant. Uh, the theater, one of the several in the park, was built in the 1787, uh, replacing a small, smaller wooden building. The author of the new construction was the young Christian Kamzeser, who got to know the ancient theaters uh, from his king-sponsored uh, trips uh, to Italy, Greece, and Turkey. Um, According uh, to Marek Kwiatkowski, the long-term director of the Wazienki, uh, Royal Wazienki Museum, the form of the theater aud audience, which you see on, uh, on my left, uh, on your right, uh, the theater audience was inspired by the theater in Herculanum, which you can see here. This, there is a drawing uh, Francesco Piranesi, as I said, uh, which was in the contact with uh, the king. And what about uh, uh, the stage decoration? The artificial ruin with a colonnade in the Corinthian uh, order resembles the engravings of the Robert Wood uh, of Balbeck and Palmer Palmera who published them in the 1750s, which you can see here. Balbeck and Palmera. Uh, Palmera. You can see some similarities in the form of the ruins and using the uh, plants uh, at the top of the uh, colonnades to be uh, more similar to the uh, ruins of Balbec and Palmera. Uh, that what I showed you today is only a small part of references to antiquity in the Royal Wazianki. In the times of Stanislaus uh, August, the park was a place where Cassius' influences were very strong. The personal interests of the king, uh, as well as the fashion and curiosity about the ancient world prevailing through Europe, translated into the form and shape of 
Łazienki. The inspirations were sometimes, sometimes direct and sometimes indirect, as in the case of grotesque, grotesque uh, which could be inspired by Rafael Logias. Uh, royal patronage, of course, uh, was very uh, important and the uh, education of court artists. Uh, Łazienki that have survived to our times are a very important heritage of the 18th century uh, classic uh, residential architecture uh, of the time of classicism and the Enlightenment, when ancient art and culture determined the taste of European allies. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Apparently, if you go to Wazienki, wherever you go, you will see some Asian traces. Um, now we will, uh, we will invite Hugh Callimore to take the floor. Hugh is a PhD student from the Warburg Institute uh, when he also finished his AM in Cultural, Intellectual and Visual History. Um, he examined uh, the use of Asian weaponry in Netherlandish old, uh, old master paintings. Uh, b before Warburg, Hugh was um, working in Australian National University in Canberra, uh, studying and working and assistant curator at the Australia War Memorial. And today he will, as I understood, present us a part of his PhD research. Uh, and he will talk about discovery and reinter reinterpretation of Egyptian obelisk in Rome during antiquity and the Renaissance. All right. Please excuse the laptop. I couldn't find a printer this morning, but anyway. <laughs> so in 28 BC, following the Battle of Actium, Egypt became part of the Roman Empire. And soon after that, objects of significance, most notably obelisks, began to be shipped to the capital. With most weighing tens, sometimes hundreds of tons, this was a colossal effort. Today, the city with the most surviving ancient Egyptian obelisks is Rome, with 13. Some of these are genuinely Egyptian, and some are Roman copies. This paper presents on the recovery, uh, the rediscovery, and reinterpretation of these obelisks in Rome, both during antiquity and the Renaissance, and even the 20th century, with a particular focus on Florence and Rome. From Poggio Bracciolini's writing on the sacred letters of hieroglyphics in 1448, to increased interest in anything Egyptian based on Italian Neoplatonism and the discovery that Plato learned all of his wisdom from Egypt. So on the origin of obelisks in Europe, Isidore of Seville wrote in the sixth century on obelisks that the obelisk, Mephres, king of Egypt, is said to have been the first to make an obelisk for the following reason, because the Nile, once had damaged Egypt with a violent flood, the indignant king, as if to exact a penalty from the river, shot an arrow into the water. Not long afterwards, seized by a serious illness, he lost his sight. And once his vision was restored after this blindness, he consecrated two obelisks to the sun god. Obelisk or obeliscus is the name of the arrow that is set up in the middle of, also set up in the middle of the circus, uh, the ancient racetracks, um, because the sun runs through the middle of the world. And moreover, the obelisk set up in the midpoint of the space of the racetrack, equidistant from the two turning points, represents the peak and summit of heaven. Since the sun moves across it, the midpoint of hours, equidistant from either end of its course. Set on top of the obelisk is a golden object shaped like a flame, for the sun has an abundance of heat and fire within it. So it's at this point that we must discuss the difficulty of looking at the text and establishing what exactly is and isn't an obelisk. When you think about how an obelisk looks like a pyramid today, they're quite different. Even, but there's, there's historically been this confusion. This is a great map of Rome where you see some of these obelisks and pyramids. But 1552, Sebastian Munster published this map. And if you look at it, the pyramids are rectangular. Now, writing in 390, the Roman historian Ammianus Marcellinus explained that the figure pyramid has that name among geometers because it narrows into a cone after the manner of fire, which our language called pur. Later lexicographers 
would derive it alternatively from the Greek word for cereal grain. Stephen of Byzantium wrote in 550, they were called pyramids from the word for grain, which the king collected his grain from. This derivation was then repeated in the mid 12th century by the compiler of the Etymological Magnum, the largest Byzantine lexicon, with the addition that these royal granaries were constructed by Joseph, the biblical Joseph. And it was still repeated 400 years later by Johann Scapula in the lexicon Greco-Latinum in 1580. Now, the idea of Joseph's granaries, they generally take a flat top. This is a 14th century uh, image of one. Um, and you see that they're quite different to what we see now as pyramids, but they, ki they kind of resemble the rectangular ones that we see in the Munster map. So they're this sort of weird hybrid. So the next important source for obelisk knowledge that we get is by the English traveler, Magister Gregorius in the 12th century. Uh, he wrote a travel manuscript on Rome. Now he reports that the Vatican obelisk, so that which we see in front of St. Peter's today, as a monument of the tomb of Julius Caesar with a bronze globe at the top containing his ashes. He refers to both obelisks and pyramids, that of the pyramid of Cestius and the Meta Romuli, which was Rome's second pyramid that was demolished in the 17th century, the marble of which went to pave today's St. Peter's Cathedral, uh, Basilica. There are also texts from this period which really mix up the idea of obelisks and pyramids because they call both in Italian, acu, acu, sorry, uh, gulia in Italian or acucula in Latin, meaning needle or pin. And Magister Gregorius writes, there are many pyramids in Rome, oh, I read that, sorry. Um, and the, yeah, Caesar, his uh, ashes were in the sphere at the top. And apparently, this obelisk sat on top of bronze lions, which we see in this great early 14th century fresco. And it was around this time that hieroglyphics became of interest as well. And so it was believed by these uh, humanists that were researching uh, the ancient Greek writers that hieroglyphics were the, the oldest possible language. They learned that Plato learned his wisdom from ancient Egypt. And Plato writes that hieroglyphics were the source of the first language. So it was believed that if you understood hieroglyphics, you could understand the Priscia Theologia, the first language, the language of Adam. And so next, we move on to my key case study. So for many of you, if you've been to Rome and been to the Pantheon, just around the corner from the Pantheon is this wonderful elephant and obelisk. Now my case study goes from the 6th century BT to the 1940s. This is by Benini, and the obelisk is called the Minerveo. The obelisk was originally erected by the pharaoh Apries, um, and he was ruled between 589 and 570 BC. The hieroglyphs on it read, Golden Horus Wahib, king of Upper and Lower Egypt, to ladies Nebkepesh, Neb and beloved of Atom, great god, foremost of Sais, give life like Ra forever. And the golden king Horus of Upper and Lower Egypt, lord of strength, beloved of Atom, great god most of Tar Unket, give life like Ra forever. It was brought to Rome at an unknown date and placed in the Serapeum in, in uh, the Forum and excavated near the church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in 1665. Now, in 1651, Benini had also used another obelisk in his uh, famous Fontana de Quattro Fiume, uh, the, the Fountain of Four Rivers, which is today in, I believe, the Piazza Navona. And that features a, a Roman obelisk, uh, uh, what's the word, commissioned by the Emperor Domitian in 51. It was also from the Serapeum. So here we have um, Benini's ideas for the sketches for that, uh, for that uh, four, fa four Rivers Fountain on the right. And one of his proposed uh, designs was the one on the left that we see a few years later. Now, my personal favorite is the one on the left where there's this god that's trying to wrangle this obelisk and control it. Um, but anyway, so Benini puts forward these four designs that you see on the right. And it was Alexander VII who said, I don't like any of them. Let's go with your design from 15 years ago. And so, 
what I believe Bernini's source was, was this 1499 book called the Hypnomachia Polyphily, which was written by Francis Colonna. And now, while nothing has directly been linked between the book and Bernini, I think you can see the similarities are pretty strong. All right, so the, the Hypnomachia Polyphily, or polyph Polyphilo's Strife of Love and a Dream, is a really bizarre book. Written in 1499, it tells the story of its protagonist, Polyphilo, or lover of all things dream, where he pursues his love, Polya. Uh, and on the way, encounters all manner of different objects from antiquity. These objects are a bizarre mix of Greco-Roman and Egyptian. And at one point, he even discovers a hieroglyphic text, which is this one on the right, which is not really hieroglyphic. But it's in the hieroglyphic style, so he says. Um, and the figures in the, in the red box, for example, read, from your labor to the God of nature, sacrifice freely. It's a bit of a long way to get there, but he does explain it in quite a lot of detail. But Polyphilo says, I returned to another object, which was, and not far distant from the horse, straightforward, a huge elephant of more black stone than obsidian, powdered over with small spots of gold and glimpses of silver, as thick as dust glistening in the sun. Upon his back was a saddle of furniture of brass, of two girths going under his large belly, between which two being buckled up with buckles of the same stone. There interset a quadrangle correspondent to the breadth of the obelisk placed upon the saddle. Upon three parts or sides of the four square obelisks were engra engraved Egyptian characters. This huge beast stood upon four of exquisite workmanship upon the plain level and upper part of the base, hewn and cunningly fashioned being a porphyry stone with two, and th with two large and long teeth of pure white stone, referring to the tusks there, and clear, apt and fastened. And to the four girth on either side was a rich buckle covered with decorative jewels. So to bring this forward to the 20th century, we have to look at Salvador Dali. So here we have dream caused by the flight of a bee, which is really interesting because you're carrying on this idea of a dream that you see in the Hypnomachia polyphily. Um, so actually the full title of this work is, yeah, is a uh, dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate a second before awakening. So in 1962, Dali stated that dream caused by the flight of a bee was intended to express for the first time in images Freud's discovery of the typical dream with a lengthy narrative. The consequence of the instantaneousness of a chance event which causes the sleeper to wake up. Thus, as a bar might fall on the neck of a sleeping person, causing them to wake up and for a long dream to end with the guillotine blade falling on them, the noise of the bee here provokes the sensation of the sting which will awaken Gala. Now, Gala was his wife and the lady depicted here. It requires more research, but it seems Dali had a knowledge of the Hypnomachia because he made a film in 1948 in the Parco dei Mostri in Italy that features several sculptures based on the book, which is said to have inspired his temptation of St. Anthony, which is this work, where again, we see the elephant and the obelisk. And so there we have it. We have a story of ancient Egyptian obelisks. We go from the 6th century BC through to the Renaissance, this bizarre book of dreams, and then to Salvador Dali's dreams. And that's my short history of the elephant and the obelisk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope we'll dream about elephants and obelisk this night. Um, the last uh, presentation was supposed to be made by Dr. Anastasia Baukova, but she couldn't come at the end. So we changed a bit the program, and now we'll listen to uh, Michał Kuzmiński, who was supposed to be in the last panel. Uh, Mr. Kuzmiński, who you all, I think, already met, he is PhD student at the Doctoral School of Social Science uh, at the University of Warsaw and graduated uh, before also from the same uh, university. 
that we are guests now, and he's uh, working on a dissertation about the transformation of urban public space, focusing of the Roman uh, Forum at the late antiquity. Um, Michał Kuzmiński was also a visiting scholar at the American Academy in Rome in 2023. And now we will listen to his performance uh, about distant echoes of antiquity in the hunting lodge of the Polish kings. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello once again to all. And um, thank you to the organizers for letting me speak to you for this opportunity. And um, well, undoubtedly, one of the biggest, the, the brightest stars when it comes to the reception of antiquity in the history of the Polish culture was the last king of Poland, Stanisław August Poniatowski, whom we've uh, already mentioned several times during our conference. And uh, in my presentation, I am going uh, back to uh, the subject which is related to Poniatowski. And I'm going to speak about one of his residences, which is a little bit less known than uh, Royal Łazienki, which is very central, and which is packed with the um, uh, with those echoes of antiquity. Well, I'm going to speak about the palace, the royal palace, the hunting lodge uh, in Kozienice, which was a uh, property of the Polish kings for several centuries. It was very conveniently located on the way between Krakow and Vilnius, which were the main political centers of the Polish-Lithuanian country, and uh, located in the center of the old forest, so um, very conveniently located on the way and packed with uh, wild animals, a great place for hunting. So it was quite often visited and very, very much liked by Stanisław August who made it uh, one of his favorite residences. It's worth mentioning that his private collection of uh, paintings, his collection, his, his library also uh, was held in, in three places, the Royal Castle, the Royal Łazienki and Kozienice Palace. Uh, the palace was uh, given by the, by the Tsar in the 19th century to one of his generals. And until the uh, First World War, it remained in, in hands of this family. At the end of the 19th century, it was heavily rebuilt uh, in a style of a French Renaissance. And in this photograph, you can see uh, the form of the palace from uh, how it looked like after this uh, rebuilt. It was completely destroyed during the Second World War, so um, uh, almost none of it survived, and especially almost none of the palace which was built by Stanisław August. But luckily, we have some drawings, we have some um, plans of the building remaining that give us impression of what the palace looked like. It was, it was designed by uh, the royal architect, one of the royal architects, Francesco Placidi, who is classified by the historians as um, architect of the late Baroque. But in the design of this uh, palace, which he designed uh, for Poniatowski in Kozienice, we already can spot some neoclassical elements. We have uh, the pilasters in a, in a, uh, in a grand order. Uh, we have the attic, which is also adorned with sculpted vases. Um, Unfortunately, as I said, we can judge uh, about this element only basing of, on the uh, surviving documents, which are also, we, we don't have access to a plenty of them. And uh, quite, I would, I, I think that the only part of the original decoration which existed in this place in the time of Poniatowski were two groups, the two sculpted groups uh, with the hunting scenes. Uh, one with the hunting scene, uh, the hunting of a boar, and one uh, the hunting of the bear. Um, they survived until the Second World War, and uh, then they uh, were uh, damaged and uh, removed, and later on they were reconstructed. Uh, so the, despite all those um, historical changes of the environment, they managed to survive through the, 18, uh, through the 19th century and they form remains uh, until today. And um, the author of those sculptures 
uh, was the subject, was a matter of discussion for a longer time. There were different theories about who sculpted this, these two groups. Um, uh, the, some scholars uh, claimed uh, some, some unknown uh, Italian sculpture, uh, some others claimed the different artists from the uh, royal court, and uh, an essential archive in Warsaw, I've managed to find the uh, uh, documents which uh, confirm uh, the authorship of the uh, statues, uh, namely on the left we have a uh, obligation of one of the sculptures from the royal court, Franciszek Pink, to, who obliges him himself to uh, create these statues. And on the right we have a document uh, uh, in which he complains about not having been paid for this. So the problem with delays of the payments is not just the uh, issue of our time. Uh, so we are sure about the, the authorship of the, of the sculptures. It was uh, one of the members of the, uh, of the group of the sculptures uh, from the royal court of uh, Poniatowski. Uh, Pink was uh, involved to a great extent uh, in works of embellishing uh, the royal residences of Poniatowski in uh, the royal castle and also the royal Wazienki. Perhaps yesterday you were able to see some of his works, like, for example, the so-called Dying Cleopatra, uh, which in fact is a sleeping Ariadne, uh, or the Gladiator, so-called, or the most famous work of uh, Pink, which is the monument of a king of the Polish king, John uh, III Sobieski. Um, so, once the author of the uh, sculptures is established firmly, let's say, uh, I started asking a question about the prototype of the, the original um, inspiration for, the, for these sculptures. And it's worth mentioning at the beginning that, um, in fact, these sculptures, these groups are just the mirror reflections. So uh, if we're looking for the prototype of the um, group uh, that would be organizing the space in this, in this uh, statues, we should, we should look in fact for just one singular prototype. And um, one of the ideas of these scholars was that possibly pink had his had taken his inspiration from uh, some kind of a porcelain figurines uh, showing the uh, the hand scene with a, with a boar, for example, uh, of which uh, we have quite a big variety. As and as you can see, um, it it could be it could serve as a quite good source of inspiration for this depiction. Uh, however, it doesn't. Um, provide an archetype, a prototype for the whole scene, for the whole, um, uh, for the whole group of figures together with the huntsman. And um, it's worth mentioning also that uh, Franciszek Pink, although he was a good sculptor, he was, uh, let's say, hardworking, fastworking, and produced uh, sculptures of good quality. He has a fame among the scholars, he had a fame of, uh, he earned a fame, let's say, uh, of an artist who was not a very original, creative one. Um, and there is quite often a discussion concerning his works about the influence of the first and the most important sculpture on the royal court of Poniatowski, Andre Le Brun, um, who uh, very often um, designed the works which Pink only sculpted later on or, or casted. And um, perhaps that's the case also here. And speaking of Le Brun, he, is, he was the French sculptor uh, who had his education mostly in France and in Rome. So uh, types of his, uh, types of the influences that shaped his artistical work uh, were mostly, let's say, uh, of, of two kinds. The first one, the inspiration taken from the ancient art, naturally, um, 
uh, shaped uh, during during his time spent mostly during his time spent in Rome. And uh, if we think about the hunting scene, especially the hunting scene with a uh, uh, man holding a spear, uh, fighting with a bow, the um, the first association that should come to our mind if we think about the ancient art uh, would naturally be the scene of the hunt for the Caledonian bow with a Meliagar uh, fighting with a bow. And uh, as it happens, it was quite a popular uh, subject to depict in the ancient art. We have uh, quite many depictions of, of this scene on the uh, sarc uh, of the on the ancient sarcophagi, and uh, they usually uh, um, uh, depict the scene is in a very very similar way. So as you can see, uh, in principle, it's um, the idea, let's say, although in an example of those of those statues of pink, it's it's reduced without the other. Uh, uh, of the other figures, but the idea is preserved with a uh, spearman fighting with a, a bow, which is at the same time attacked by dogs. But um, the way he's holding his spear um, is 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 uh, definitely different. And um, the other example is uh, just just to show you how the how this chain of um, uh, of uh, mutual inspirations uh, taking their origin in, in ancient art was uh, going on. Uh, the the um, painting by Rubens, uh, which is quite clearly uh, taking inspiration also from the from those uh, ancient reliefs. And um, if we look in this second part, let's say second kind of inspirations uh, that influenced uh, Le Brun, uh, we may find, uh, we should look at uh, closely uh, at the royal uh, palaces uh, of the French kings, uh, naturally Louvre, Versailles, and uh, in our case, uh, the most useful will be the palace in Marly, uh, in which uh, there, are, there were several uh, sculptures um, of uh, executed by the uh, French sculptor Nicolas Cousteau. The palace did not survive until today. It was destroyed during the French Revolution. However, the sculptures survived and they are now kept in the Louvre Museum. Uh, s uh, some of the copies uh, were uh, displayed and the place of the park where the uh, Mali Palace uh, once stood. And uh, as you can see, here we have an uh, example of, uh, again, uh, a scene of a Miliaga fighting with the bow, and it was made by Nicolas uh, Cousteau. Uh, he lived uh, a few generations, let's say, before uh, Pink, because <laughs> As it happens, uh, Cousteau died exactly at the same year, 1733, as uh, when uh, Pink was born in 1733. Um, and uh, uh, for sure, as we know also from the documents, Le Brun was very well aware of the objects of art which were, relay, uh, which were kept in, in these pa uh, palaces of the um, French kings, uh, which makes it... Um, very much probable because we do not have uh, the documents which would say uh, with a hundred percent that would make us hundred percent sure that it was the prototype uh, of the of the uh, sculptures made by Pink and possibly designed by Lebrun. But it is quite quite uh, probable, as you can see, the the way the uh, the huntsman holds a spear is exactly the same and uh, the organization of the space is, is very uh, similar, which makes us, uh, I think, to, um, to meditate, let's say, a little bit about how the uh, inspiration derived from the ancient art was mingling, was mixing in different, um, in different periods and influencing the artists' um, uh, 
let's say, attacking them from different angles, not just directly uh, from, uh, from the ancient time. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Michal. And uh, if I would like to summarize what we heard this morning. In this uh, panel of Echoes of Antiquity in uh, 16th, 19th century art, I would say that the big subjects of your research is mainly the question of transition, so direct and indir uh, indirect transition of those uh, models and um, temps and uh, variety of subjects, and also the agent or actant, if we want to use the terms of Bruno Latour, so including travelers, archaeologists, printmakers, artists, researchers, but also the question which was very present here is a question of authorship, like originality, question of value, copy, false, and also uh, including changing of, of perception and values of these different types of, of objects. And again, another huge subject is the question of practices, including collecting, traveling, using ancient models and objects, but also, which is also very important, um, this economical perspective of all those practices. And now I would like to open the discussion. We have almost, uh, almost 30 minutes for discussion, so I open it. And uh, who would like to start with a question or a comment? Maybe uh, adjust more than a question is a comment op to open. Uh, I completely agree these are the key topics or key themes that we addressed. And maybe another interesting topic that was present in the morning, but in general in the use and reuse of antiquity is the concept of contamination. Like in the object, like the obelisk is a perfect example, like Bernini. And then later, how antiquity and modern, but also uh, geometry and the sculpture, different materials are combined. And this is creativity. And this is also why it is so vital, the presence of antiquity, because it's every time reinvented. And uh, of course, and around this uh, contamination, of course, comes the question of authenticity, what is original, what is new, what is value, and uh, also, very crucial, the value shift. This value is not something that remains. It changes over time, and uh, every period has its own criteria for attributing a value or not. Also, in the gem story, what is the value? Is the material itself, which is not uh, original or which is not a gem, or the, the way it is worked. So what is the, the value? It's just and uh, not a question to someone, but just to introduce another concept. Yeah, of course, and we spoke about the, the, the gems uh, in the, the, the break, uh, coffee break room, that uh, again, this value change is in time, and 19th century copies were f like, like seeing as false in 19th century, 18th century, 19th century, but now we see them in the perspective of the collection of, uh, of collectors of 18th century, and sometimes they are much more valued and antique <laughs> games. So it's, it's very interesting how it changed. Another question or comment? Um, I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Brilovsky. Is, is he? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I will not. <laughs> I can give the microphone to someone else. <laughs> Thank you. I got a, a question to Professor Gabriella uh, regarding um, the second style, if you found any traces or examples of uh, iron or production where 
according to August Mao's classification of, of the Pompeian styles that are more in the vein of the second second style or if it's almost exclusively ex exclusively the third style that is uh, groundbreaking or, or exemplified. Uh, thank you very much. This is a very good question. At the beginning, I was uh, saying no, because actually the idea that I proposed and presented was that they were, because the second style, for those who are not familiar, is the more realistic style. The first style is just like uh, the uh, like a painted wall with uh, very simplified geometric design. The second style is the more realistic, and the architects weren't looking for realistic stone architecture. They were looking for a surrealistic, uh, very thin, airy, another kind of style. But there is a Hittorf who was archaeologist and architect who uh, reinterpreted this second style and imagined that uh, in Petra, this carved facade in Petra, very famous, was um, inspired or there was a connection between this carved uh, facade and the second style Pompeian, um, Pompeian paintings and especially in a house, I don't remember the name. So there was some uh, connection uh, between real architecture and second style painting, but not in iron, because it was the aesthetic of iron requires another kind of linear geom uh, geometry, yes. Uh, to this remark about architecture of Petra, I would like also add some remarks about Hellenistic architecture of Alexandria. Uh, of course, we do not have um, any big monuments of palatial architecture of Alexandria, but a kind of echo of this architecture is Palazzo, of, uh, uh, Palazzo delle Colonne in Ptolemais in Cyrenaica. So, yes, and the facade uh, which was reconstructed and a lot, a huge number of architectural decoration elements was found by Italians, uh, not a banner, just um, uh, before the Second World War. And um, mm, there are some graphic reconstruction of Palazzo. And um, the researcher um, now, uh, they are using uh, Palazzo della Colonne uh, as a mm, kind of proof that this architecture in the second style uh, even uh, made in stone was indeed realistic. Any other question or comments? Uh, I have a question for Janika. You show us uh, beautiful wall paintings your uh, Tartu collection. Um, and you said uh, one room is Poeta Tragico, one room the Casa, Casa de Vetti, um, and Casa de Bronze. Do you use in your collection, Tutti White, uh, it, uh, um, the presentation of your, your plaza cars from archaic, classic, Hellenistic, do they follow such a shame? Um, our plaster cast is organized uh, in chronologically at the moment, uh, starting with um, uh, archaic period and uh, end up uh, with some Roman statues. Uh, but um, it, it, it uh, doesn't uh, depend on the color of the rooms or the examples um, initial examples of the room paintings. Because um, the wall paintings were uh, finished uh, six, uh, uh, 1868, uh, 
uh, but uh, the massive um, coming of uh, blasters uh, started uh, in the first half of the 60s and uh, they were ordered until uh, 1915, so the rooms were already painted when uh, blasters came to museum. And I have also a question to you, and I would like to ask about the, the transition of forms from Pompeii to Tartu. Uh, you told us that um, they were used some um, illustrations, color illustration, but also uh, itching, if I understood well. But uh, do you know how they came in this 18th century from Italy to Tartu? Um, if there were some travelers or scholars or researchers or, you know, uh, how it's happened? Okay, uh, in, the co in the concept of University of Tartu Museum and Pompeian uh, wall paintings, uh, uh, we can uh, follow the um, inventory um, books of the university's library and art museum. So we can see Wilhelm Zahn's album were arrived uh, already in uh, museum and library collections and it's quite, um, we're quite sure they were used as uh, examples and the master who painted the wall uh, was also local, uh, so the ordering uh, took place after the albums have arrived to Tartu. Because we but do you know how they arrived? If they were collectors who uh, No, no. Uh, the uh, art museum was opened already 1803 when the mun uh, University of Tartu were re reopened and uh, uh, there was a one person, Johann Karl Simon Morgenstern, who was the director of art museum and at the same time also director of the library. And he started collecting very quickly. He started to combine uh, library collections and uh, to order um, artistic uh, items for art museum. And he is a person who um, uh, started uh, to order all kinds of uh, materials. Uh, and uh, later uh, other directors uh, followed his, uh, his example and uh, ordered from different bookshops uh, from Europe, but they were ac uh, accessible to get. Uh, and um, if some traveled in Europe, they also um, gave orders and later arrived to Tartu. So we could say that this director is somehow an author of iconography. Uh, probably. Sorry, that probably he was also the author of the choice of the iconography that we uh, used. No, the, the choice was made uh, later by um, uh, uh, by um, another the following director who uh, was in later decades uh, directing the museum. And for by that time, uh, more Pompeian uh, houses were exca excavated by this time because in the beginning of the 19th century, it was. Uh, quite early time. Uh, if I may, I would like to add something about this topic of the circulation of the books, which was the vehicle for disseminating this style at the beginning. But of course, at the late 18th century, beginning 19th century, these books were very, very lu were l luxury. These products were very expensive. The first chromo lithography, lithographies, or the um, books that, the, like the Antiquità di Ercolano, that the court of Naples produced in a very limited number. Ah, they had a kind of monopoly of these uh, drawings. They didn't let visitors in Pompeii draw. It was officially not possible to draw because they wanted to make these huge books and then make this kind of monopoly of the circulation of the um, of these inches of uh, so for example i know that uh, i didn't show it because it wasn't iron but the first very first three dimensional representation of the colonnette of the paintings i found it in uh, russia st petersburg where the uh, le court had like ordered these ercolano books and was impressed, and then they reproduced this colonnette in the interiors in porcelain. So the very first image was actually not in iron, so the first three-dimensional adaptation was in porcelain, and the vehicle for this image was, of course, the book that they had, but the books were limited to the courts at the beginning. They were not popular products, and afterward it became more and more uh, popular, but at the beginning was only limited to a few uh, copies. Uh, 
if I, I, I may, I, could also, I would like to also uh, have a comment or a question to you, Hume. Uh, it's about authorship of this ancient um, objects, let's say, because mostly we don't know who scarf they, who, who, do, who did it. And um, I, I was surprised by the, um, by the text that followed your image of this Bernini um, elephant that you have written um, unknown Egyptian carvers and uh, B Bernini, and I liked it a lot. And I think I would like to ask about this practice to, to mention this artist that I think I never saw before, and I found it really great that you did it. And uh, I don't know if it's something new, like a new you know, way of thinking, which, um, uh, which underline this unknown unknown uh, artists or um, yeah, makers, stone makers? Well, I think for me, there's a twofold answer to that. What the, the first is that the obelisks that were there in ancient Rome, some were made in Rome, some were made in Egypt, some were made in Egypt and then they were carved in, they had hieroglyphics carved in Rome. So there's a bit of confusion about the actual origins of them. But um, in terms of having sort of unknown Egyptian carvers, um, it's something I've seen a lot in scholarship on African art and um, uh, like Asia Pacific art um, more and more over the last few years. And I think it's, um, well, particularly Australian Aboriginal art. There's, there's a lot of emphasis on, um, you know, saying uh, as like a colonized nation, um, there's a lot of emphasis on acknowledging the impact of colonialism on Australia. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's now become quite common in Australian scholarship where if you can't identify um, the person, you say, uh, you know, like the language group that the Aboriginal person came from, uh, you know, um, say, Dharawal, um, unknown Dharawal artist. Or I've even seen uh, the word ancestor used. Um, that's becoming more and more common, um, I think, in, in Maori art as well. Um, just as a sort of respectful way of acknowledging that culture um, and sort of giving a bit of uh, attribution there where you can. I found this great because usually the translucent, you know, transparent. So you never mention them, you just mention the name of the object. And then there was someone who worked on it. It's great that, you know, it's this starts to change a bit uh, and to give a respect and a place for those artists and, and, and craftsmen. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to add to that that um, I was recently at the Detroit Institute of Arts and they have redone all their labels so that um, in like galleries of Egyptian and Assyrian art it also credits usually um, basically always unknown artists of period and place, um, and the same is true in their um, indigenous American galleries. So I think it's becoming more and more common for ancient art as well. Um, I, I think a lot of uh, museums in the US have started doing that for ancient galleries too. But this was even more interesting because you have this Bernini, who is a giant, and this anonymous artist who you, know, who you never mentioned because it's a work of Bernini, and then you have the two of them. Um, I also have another question for Hugh. Um, in thinking about this case study that you've chosen with the obelisk that's clearly in dialogue with this Benini, they're like linked to each other. Is it more common uh, to see obelisks outside of Egypt in this context that you're talking about um, erected on their own or uh, as part of a new sculpture or as sort of a collaboration, if you will, between a more contemporary artist and the Egyptian craftsman? I think Benini's uh, the most over-the-top interpretation of how an obelisk is presented from uh, the obelisks I know of. What we do see a bit of is, say, in the Piazza del Popolo in Rome, they tried to, it, it was erected by a Kigi Pope, and they have put all their own little marks on it. So they've tried to sort of Egyptianify it. So they've got, say, copies of the Nect and Ebo lions, which were also brought over to Rome in antiquity at the base. Um, but then on top of the obelisk, you've got, so the Kiki family were represented by a series of molehills. You've got that on the top, and then I think a star on top of that as well. So I think Bernini's the most elaborate. Um, 
but yeah, you certainly do see quite a few obelisks in Rome where the popes have put that the popes that had them erected in place have um, put their little symbol on top. And of course, I'm forgetting the the obelisk that I mentioned in my talk, the the Four Fountains um, sculpture in Piazza Navona, which is again by Benini and supposedly translated by Athanasius Kierke, um, and it's just all levels of confusing iconography. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's really interesting how you have this overlap between, um, sort of going back to your comment, um, where you've got an ancient Egyptian symbol, but it's been sort of reappropri reappropriated in a way that we would never do it today. Um, yeah. Any other person who would like to take the voice? Do we close the discussion? So, yeah, I think there's no other question. So I close this panel and invite you for lunch. And we met again at uh, 1.45, yeah, quarter to, to two.
Uh, okay, so I think we can uh, resume. Oh. Check that. And uh, we had a slight uh, change of plans, and uh, because of that, I'm going to be the chairman of this panel. And, and it is my pleasure to invite the keynote speaker of this panel, who is Professor Maya Hansen from the University of Copenhagen, uh, with the speech entitled Transformation Matters, the Appropriation and Reuse of the Ancient Past in Rome. The floor is yours. Do you, do you have the presentation already on the computer? Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks to the organizers and especially Mikhail Kuzminski for uh, all your effort in, in uh, preparing this rich interdisciplinary conference. For me, it's been a very welcome opportunity to visit Warsaw, so thank you very much. My paper today will deal with a small chapter of the echoes of antiquity, namely the early Christian and medieval reuse of ancient Roman buildings. The use of the so-called spolia in terms of variegated columns, capitals, and other pieces of building material taken from older buildings and put to new use as we see it here in Santa Maria and Cosmedina in Rome. From late antiquity and through the medieval period, ancient Roman buildings were appropriated or recreated through the use of spolia, a practice of recycling, which was the rule rather than an exception in the vast areas of Western Europe, once dominated by the Roman Empire. In my lecture, I will take my point of departure in the relations between the buildings of antiquity and the early medieval reproductions in order to open for reflections and discussions of the concept of reception and appreciation also in more general terms and also in our own time. The medieval practice of building with spolia displays the fundamental condition of architecture as a phenomenon in flux rather than as permanent structures with one clear-cut point of origin. Permanence is, however, part of most people's immediate impression of architecture with its static, materially strong and protecting qualities. I'm aware that you, as an audience interested in the history and temporality of architecture, and particularly in the echoes of antiquity, that you are an exception to this common notion, uh, and indeed, the theme of this conference manifests that building and urban spaces are in continuous flux. An architectural theorist today acknowledged that notions of originality are founded on or invested with modernist ideologies. When I teach the architectural history of Europe to my students, I thus have to face a dilemma. Do I want, to open, I want to open the students' eyes to the stylistic characteristics of each period, but at the same time, I'm eager to convey a consciousness of continuous transformation, the story of the ongoing use of and inspiration from antiquity in the history of European architecture holds the potential of illustrating this continuous flux. By way of introduction to the field of architectural transformation and its echoes of antiquity, I will say a few words about a book I published last year, together with my partner Lars Hornemann, who will be joining us this afternoon at the, at the tour to the, to the Saxon Palace. He's a graphic novelist and uh, made the illustrations for our book. 
The book is a general architectural history, the architectural history of the Western world, presented chronologically through the more than 2,000 years spanning from the time of the Roman Empire until today. The book is intended for students and other non-specialist readers, but while it provides a general overview of European architectural history, it is a, part a particularity of the book that we will tell this story exclusively with buildings from Rome as examples. A consequence of our starting point in Roman antiquity and with Rome as the place from which we take our examples is that pertinent to the theme of this conference, a common denominator of the book is the translation and reinterpretation of antiquity that has taken place over the centuries. So on the one hand, the book consists of a very traditional division of history into periods, and we do attempt to describe some characteristic features of the different periods. And this is uh, the first page of the chapter on antiquity. But on the other hand, we also have also wanted to stress and illustrate the continuous transformation taking place through time. This is a reason why we have chosen to include only drawings as illustrations. The book features a range of different modes of drawings by Lars Warnemann. Drawings offer the possibility of conventional plans, sections and prospects as we see here. Uh, in an example of a page from the chapter on the Baroque. But in addition to this generalized or abstract presentation of a building, drawings also offer the possibility of elucidating the temporality of the buildings and urban spaces. Because the architecture of the city of Rome has been rebuilt through two millennia, the drawings make the representation of a building's former appearance possible just as drawings can visualize what has been added or changed at later dates. These illustrations show the famous Piazza Navona, uh, that it is an echo uh, in space of an ancient Roman stadium. And the theater of Marcellus is another case in point. Here the drawing can point to how the theater looked at the time it was built and how it turned into a ruin later and was rebuilt to a palace. Moreover, the book features uh, a format we call narrating by drawing, where we try to illustrate the transformation of antiquity through time. We want to show how the city builds upon antiquity, yet is transformed through the centuries as well. In the first image, we get an impression of the theater back in Roman antiquity, complemented with sculptural and polychrome painted decoration. In the second illustration, we see the building in its 18th and 19th century condition, where the ancient structure has been superimposed with apartments. The ground level has raised considerably, and the arcades function as spaces for various workshops. In the third image, then, we, we show the building in its contemporary excavated and musealized condition with a full ground level fenced off due to the many tourists and the travertine cleaned to a pristine white appearance. Most tourists will take for granted that this is the building, the, that this is the building's correct and original condition, and they will respectfully admire the building skills of the ancient Romans as if the building had remained unchanged through time. So with our book, we wish to sharpen our, our view of the historical layers of architecture and point to the archeological areas of the city of Rome as a construct of the 19th century, rather than an image of ancient Rome, and thus critically address our contemporary one-dimensional dimensional notions of originality. A final example in this little preamble uh, about our book and its illustrations of architectural transformation through time is this one, where we illustrate the trajectory of a column through the last 2,000 years. We begin in the quarry in ancient Greece. Uh, we see the column in, in a temple, which however later collapses in an earthquake 
And then the column is put to new use in a church later devastated by fire. Part of the column is cut up to floor tiles in a cosmetic task pattern floor in a church. And the rest ends up as reinforcement of the corner of a house as frequently seen in Roman houses. And this story of wandering columns of the material echoes of antiquity is a topic we shall look further into now in the second part of my presentation. Working on the book made it ever more obvious to us the degree to which architecture builds on the past. The city of Rome is one long series of references back in time, and the same is the case in other European cities, also in the northern parts, like Copenhagen, uh, where I come from, or Warsaw, uh, as is obvious from the very, very room we are standing in now. But one thing is the use of antiquity as a source of inspiration in terms of formal qualities, like the use of the column orders. Another thing is the actual physical reuse of older buildings and materials in later periods. Also regarding this aspect of echoing antiquity, Rome offers a very special eye-opening chapter in the history of Western architecture, the medieval building of Spolia. Spolia is an art historical term denoting reuse, typically of architectural elements or sculpture. A characteristic of Spolia is the visible incorporation of the old into a new context. The reuse is not hidden or covered in any way. The phenomenon of building with Spolia appropriated from older buildings took pace from the early fourth century and ahead and continued until the Romanesque and Gothic periods. The use of spolia became irrelevant at this time, around the 12th century, when a growing population and an increase in wealth brought about a renewed interest in producing serial standardized building elements. The conspicuous deployment of spolia is thus particularly associated with the late antique and medieval periods of the Western world. Large areas of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East had been subject to the ancient Roman Empire and were well endowed with honored monumental buildings, theaters and amphitheaters, amphitheaters, temples, bath, and the like. With the shrinking population and dwindling economic resources of the late antique period, the practice of recycling increased. There were more public buildings than people needed and had the wealth to maintain. Moreover, many of the Roman Empire's buildings fell into disuse alongside the spread of Christianity, which was legalized in the early fourth century. The consequence of these intertwined trends meant that in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, there were plenty of unused buildings and manufactured materials available. The monumental architecture of the Roman Empire was deployed as if they were simply prefabricated building materials or the buildings were simply repurposed in their entirety. One new type of building needed to be built, however, and that was the church. From the time of the legalization of Christianity at the beginning of the fourth century, churches began to be built all over the Roman Empire all around the Mediterranean and far up into Northern Europe. The traditional Roman temples with their small dark interiors were inadequate to convert to churches since the Christian congregation required a light, hall-like building for meeting. Moreover, the Christians felt a strong aversion to the pagan temples, which they perceived as demonic. Thus, the new churches had to be erected, and the Masons found a model for this new building type in secular Roman halls known as basilicas. Here, the reuse of ancient columns and capitals became common practice, as did the use of ancient marble panels for the flooring and decorating of the lower walls of the churches. During the 4th and 5th centuries, the production of new building materials ceased completely in the western part of the Roman Empire. The reuse of materials in the Middle Ages can thus be explained pragmatically 
these were the only materials available. And in general, there are many good reasons for reusing precious or well-fabricated materials. But what is interesting in an aesthetic context is that the early Christians used the ancient building elements differently than before. The ancient Romans deployed columns and capitals in a certain systematized way, and they had systematized ways of ornamenting their building elements. The buildings exemplify the ancient system of the building, uh, the Colosseum here exemplifies the ancient system of columns adopted by the Romans from the Greeks. Here, certain proportions of the elements and shafts matched certain types of capitals and entablatures. In the multi-storied structure of the Colosseum, they superimposed the Greek style columns, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian with corresponding entablatures and a variant of Corinthian pilasters at the top. In Greco-Roman antiquity, columns of different types were never mixed within the same colonnade. We have the same standardized type throughout uh, each story, and the columns always carried a horizontal entablature as we see here. The Romans deployed arches as a novelty compared to the Greeks, as we also see in the Colosseum, but the arches were always supported by square masonry piers in a logical continuation of the structure of the masonry. The Romans never let columns support arches. Roman architecture is thus characterized by a very pronounced standardization and predictability with monotony and rationality as keywords. A monotony in the sense that the buildings are characterized by uniformity and seriality of the building elements and their ornaments. And a rationality in the sense that the buildings are structured according to systematic ratios or relationships of proportions. From the fourth century onwards, however, people began to deconstruct the classical aesthetics of systematic clarity, order, repetition, and seriality alongside their use of recycled parts. The early Christians exploited the possibilities of variation offered by the assemblage of spolia in order to create new layers of spatial meaning. For example, they frequently arranged the spolia columns in pairs, framing the nave of the church, while the excellence of ornamentation and materials were used to create a hierarchy in the building. The simpler, more uniform parts could be placed in the colonnades of the atrium in front of the church or at the entrance to the church, while the more elaborate parts in polished, brightly colored marble could be placed at the opposite, more distinguished end of the church close to the altar. In this way, the change of materials up the nave from the entrance to the holiest to the altar created a progression that corresponded to the transformation which the Christians underwent while entering the church on their way to salvation. In contrast to the predictability of the ancient Roman colonnades, the early Christians pursued the irregular and the irrational, which was a positive term at the time, as the Christian considered it arrogant to believe that everything could be understood rationally. In their churches, the mixture of disparate columns and capitals displayed that the parts had obviously not belonged together originally. Shafts of columns were matched with capitals of a larger or smaller diameter, and the variation in height brought about by the combination of these similar shafts and differently designed capitals was was dealt with by stacking them on bases and plinths so as to compensate for the variations in height. What is particularly interesting in our context is that the spolia architecture seems to have, have emphasized heterogeneity and exploited irregularity as much as possible, that is, as a meaningful, valuable aesthetic strategy. With the materials available, it would have been possible to build more uniformly if that had been an aesthetic goal. 
but instead the builders obviously preferred to emphasize the diversity of the spolia, thereby pursuing a break with the rational coherence of the past. So the early Christian and medieval spolia churches echo antiquity, but people never copied antiquity in terms of repeating the ancient building, building's formal properties, nor did they cultivate a respectful attitude towards originality or classicism as we understand these concepts today. The demonstrative heterogeneity brought about by the eclectic use of spolia corresponded to the aesthetic expression of the early Christian and medieval period also more generally speaking. A broader look at the culture from the time of the collapse of the Roman Empire and the rise of Christianity shows that the stylistic innovation of spoliation was just one example of a widespread cultural practice of appropriation and sampling. This appropriation took place not only in architecture, but also in visual art and literature, for example. The enormous variety and irregularity offered by the Spolia churches and the particular creativity inherent in the medieval cultural artistic sampling practices have only received minimal attention in art history until a few decades ago. If architectural historians surveying the early medieval period actually noticed and commented on, on the common use of spolia, they took it for granted that this building practice was caused by the economic technological crisis of the time, disrupting the continuation of classical Roman architecture. The use of spolia was perceived as a lamentable practice caused by the lack of resources and skill, a practice of default. Also in other fields of cultural studies, such as art and literary history, 20th century scholars have regularly criticized medieval appropriation practices as both an unimaginative and clumsy handling of the legacy of the past. The accumulations of disparate materials have been understood as expressions of a disenchantment combined with a depressive admiration for the lost culture of a classical golden age. In the times of economic and social crisis of late antiquity, there was, it is assumed, no leisure to create works that could compete in originality and formal clarity with the models of the Roman Empire. Therefore, they lacked, they, <coughs> people had to make do with borrowing. But instead of uh, accepting such a skeptical attitude to the early Christian and medieval practice, we could approach these architectural samplings as an aesthetic ideal that people actually preferred as an alternative to a classical approach. What if the fragmentation of the heritage of antiquity wasn't understood as a destructive fragmentation with the loss of a valuable whole as a consequence, but rather as a liberation of the individual building elements. Through this liberation, the parts could be put together in a new creative way and given a new content while the past could partly live on. Through the past decades, a confrontation with the ideologies and aesthetics of modernity has taken place just as the interest in appropriation has increased significantly. It is as if our own times have softened architectural historians' view of the medieval spolia practices and what older scholars regarded as architectural debauchery. Our own unclassical times have enabled us to see that there could be value in an architectural form that was not standardized, predictable, and monotonous. Here, a slide just as a general illustration of the deconstructivist tendencies in architecture which began in the last decades of the 20th century. The deconstructivist aesthetics have further accustomed our gaze to architecture, objecting to the predictability and the inevitable right angles and horizontal vertical articulations of modernist architecture. Today's rejection of a simplistic ideology of progress 
in terms of economical growth and of the materialism of consumer society has made us aware that in the past people may perhaps have experienced qualities in the use of spolia. A remarkable increase in art historical interest in the field of spolia surely witnesses a recognition of this medieval practice of building. Although the Middle Ages and the present are very different historical periods, and although the conditions and context for the aesthetics of reuse differ as well, the very visibility of the spolia architecture, the fact that it has become a topic for research, is linked to a contemporary sensibility towards the irregular and heterogeneous. The new interest in the qualities of spolia architecture has emerged simultaneously with the multiple manifestations of recycling in contemporary architecture. For example, in transformations of architecture of various kinds, typically industrial buildings converted into, for example, cultural functions or housing. Here, for example, the Carlsberg district in Copenhagen where efforts have been made to preserve and transform part of the old industrial buildings originally constructed for the brewing of beer in the 19th century. The concern with transformation applies to countless forms of cultural and artistic practices, exploring eclecticism, assemblage, material citations, reenactments, and similar strategies of actively, actively relating to the materials of the past. My brief historical recollection today of the medieval sampling of older buildings and the early Christian and medieval appreciation of complexity and heterogeneity may contribute to an understanding of contemporary architects who find it meaningful to borrow and build on the works of others, who find strategies of appropriation and repetition in their broader sense productive. There is a certain insight in the medieval spolia architecture that can put any architectural translation practice today in perspective. Uh, an acknowledgement of the historicity of the concept of our originality may equally temper our conventional notion and values. In modern times, in the 19th and 20th century and still today, Artistic originality has been a constant focus and often in a somewhat simplistic way. For the worship of progress, which is in inextricably linked to modernity, has sometimes led to the new being confused with the original, and this has led to expectations that artists and architects should constantly innovate, even in an immediately tangible way that is in terms of changes of, for instance, style, new materials and techniques. This collides with the main condition of virtually all architectural practice today, which is transformation. Furthermore, the current interest in material culture studies corresponds with an attention in architectural analysis to what buildings are actually made of. And it is linked to an ecological awareness of global entanglements and resource challenges. How cultural heritage was approached in the past, pragmatically and ideologically at the same time, can thus be inspiring today. The echoes of antiquity manifest in older historical material can help to make visible the critical reflections on the modern concept of originality in our own time. We have to acknowledge that modernism's ideal of universalism and timelessness falls short when it comes to architecture built for individual human beings. Architectural history shows us that buildings cannot be fixed to a specific time and musealized without dissociating them from our everyday life. We may have an urge to preserve architecture in an ideal of timelessness, but it involves the risk of anemic urban spaces. Thus, the case study of the medieval spolia not only points back in time, but may prove to be inspiring to contemporary approaches to architecture as well. Thank you. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Although we have two separate panels right now, we can see some ideas intertwining with each other, especially the architectural metabolism, so that's wonderful. And uh, now we will listen to the presentation of Dr. Eva Miller from the University College London, entitled the An Ancient Blueprint for the Modernist Future, Architectural Theory, the Mesopotamian Sigurat, and the Search for the Essential Forms. Thank you very much. Uh, so in 1922, the architectural delineator Hugh Ferris created a series of visualizations to illustrate the architectural consequences of a new piece of local New York City legislation. A 1916 zoning law limited the total area of a lot that a building could occupy after a certain height, meaning that buildings would need to be stepped back as they rose, allowing sufficient light and air to reach surrounding structures. Ferris, who was trained as an architect, but who mostly worked as a renderer on other projects, led a discourse among modern architects and critics, which understood the restrictions the law introduced as more than a prohibition against certain forms, but as a mandate for a new kind of American architectural style. Ferris's series here shows the maximum massing permitted by the new law in successive stages of abstraction, treating it first as a problem of simple mathematical calculation, before gradually bringing into focus the kinds of buildings that abstraction could produce within the limits of the law. In Ferris's four-part sequence, what ultimately emerges at the end of the skyscraper's evolution, as he also described the sequence, is both futuristic and very ancient. It is essentially the stepped pyramid ziggurat of ancient Iraq, a form that, Ferris seemed to suggest, was revealed by empirical mathematical calculation as the answer for the future. Ferris made this connection explicit in his 1929 work of futurist speculation, The Metropolis of Tomorrow. The ancient Assyrian ziggurat, he wrote, is an excellent embodiment of the modern New York legal restriction. In this paper, I consider the presence of an essential ziggurat form at the beginning and future of monumental architecture in two idiosyncratic works of architectural theory, which significantly influenced modernist concepts of building and city planning. British architect and theorist William R. Lethaby's 1891 Architecture, Mysticism, and Myth, and the American Ferris's 1929 The Metropolis of Tomorrow, which drew dire directly on Lethaby, I argue, in their shared interest in the ziggurat. Each writer arrived at this structure through distinctly modern means, but their affinity for this ancient form of monumental urban design was also, I argue, informed by familiar Western biblical and classical traditions, identifying Babylon as the home of monumental architecture and magnificent urban planning. So, William Richard Lethaby was born in 1857 in Devon, UK. Trained as an architect through apprenticeship, he oversaw few projects of his own, but was extremely influential on the late arts and crafts movement and early modernism through his writing and teaching and as art inspector for the London County Council. He lived until 1931 and remained an important touchstone and personal advisor to modernist architects in Europe and the US in the early 20th century. His most famous work of architectural history and theory was also his first, Architecture, Mysticism, and Myth. Its central claim was a simple one. Architecture, from its earliest days, has always worked through reference to the natural world, and its effect on the human psyche derives from these potent associations. At the same time, it has always reflected the mythological or cosmological world as its creators understood it. Good architecture, then, will exhibit a mixture of timeless, universal features that reference basic natural forms, like sky, sea, or mountains, and highly culturally specific forms that should express the beliefs and worldview of the society that built it. Throughout his writings, Lethaby cautioned against imitation of past styles, arguing that such school exercises are not really in the style of the prototypes, but only in the style of the style, costly monuments of would-be make-believe, for nobody really believes. Furthermore, wondrous as the great structures of the past had been, the despotic regimes that produced them had no place in Lethaby's future. He listed various magnificent structures, including terraced temples of Babylon to reach the skies, which could not and should not be built under modern free conditions, 
They represented, quote, the past, and such an architecture is not for us, nor for the future. Well, new architecture could not be an architecture of dominance and despotism, and while it was foolish to imitate the outer styles of past architects and artisans, it was possible to emulate their ethos as craftsmen without restaging the brutal conditions they worked under. Drawing on late Victorian anthropology, folklore studies, and history of religion, Lethaby understood the mythopaic worldview of ancient pre-modern peoples, or modern so-called primitive cultures, as contributing to a facility for meaningful built structures. His promotion of the ziggurat form relied on scholarship from the field of Assyriology, a discipline that in the late 19th century could legitimately claim to be revealing some of the earliest recorded history. The frontispiece with which Lethaby opened his treatise shows one historical structure, the so-called Ziggurat of Baalis in Babylon, a tower dedicated to the Babylonian god Marduk, who became head of the Babylonian pantheon in the second millennium BCE. Baalis is derived from Greek texts, a version of the Akkadian word Baal, Lord. Babylonians called the Ziggurat by a Sumerian name, a Temenanki, house that is the foundation of heaven and earth, part of the Asagil temple. While not as venerable as some ziggurats, for instance, the one at Ur, which had been consistently maintained since the third millennium BCE, in the, in the first millennium BCE, the Babylon ziggurat was the paradigmatic example of the form in Mesopotamian thought. It was also an ancient tourist attraction for outsiders. Herodotus described it as le at length in his late fifth century histories, emphasizing its magnificent monumentality and the exotic cultic events that allegedly transpired within it, an emphasis maintained in later Greek language accounts. Lethopi quotes Herodotus's famous description in his discussion of the ziggurat, but his illustration for the frontispiece is based on a then recently discovered native Babylonian source. Uh, Lethaby intended the illustration as a faithful, faithful reproduction of the dimensions given on the so-called Asagil tablet, inscribed in Akkadian cuneiform, which had been preliminarily translated in 1876 by the British self-taught Assyriologist George Smith. Smith's most famous discovery was the so-called flood tablet, the final tablet of the standard Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh, which caused a sensation when it was first translated because of striking coherences with the biblical story of Noah. While the Asagil tablet was not quite as world-shaking, it provoked a similar pleasurable, gratifying shock of recognition, an exciting confirmation and correction to Herodotus's famous architectural description of a multi-tiered towering structure. Since any ziggurats that survived in the 19th century existed in heavily eroded forms only, such a descriptive text expanded the limited image of such structures that could be provided by archaeology or exploration. In his discussion of this structure, Lethaby cites French Assyriologist Francois Lenormand explaining how the pyramidical temple is the tangible expression, the material and architectural manifestation of the Chaldeo-Babylonian religion, serving both as a sanctuary and as an observatory for the stars. For Lethaby, ziggurats exemplified the role of the temple as a symbolic reconstruction of the temple not made by hands, the world as temple, an important concept throughout his study. It clearly serves him then as an excellent example of a building of great symbolic potency. But other associations further serve to justify its position as frontispiece. Although Lethaby does not touch on this association directly, we should consider the importance of Babylonian ziggurats in a foundational and familiar myth in Christian and Jewish traditions in the Western world. The Grand Ziggurat of Babylon unavoidably evoked not only the Greek legends of its magnificence, but also the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, described in Genesis 11, 1 to 9. In the brief story of the Babel Tower, which ends the early mythic sections of Genesis, humans come together to create fired clay bricks and resolve on a joint venture. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. God, fearing that humans who could complete such a project would become unstoppable, like gods themselves, destroys the universal language and scatters humans over the face of the earth. Humans have no hope of executing such a monumental cooperative urban project in future. 
While God's disapproval in the story is unequivocal, readers have often clearly felt sympathy with the human builders of the story and perhaps nostalgia for the world their project was conceived in. Who wouldn't want to return to a world of total human unity and cooperation? As scholars like Brigitte Pede, Maria Michale, and Kyle Dugdale have explored, in the early 20th century, the Tower of Babel was a frequent association with the emerging skyscraper form of ambiguous valence. The reference could express unease about the changing look of cities and suggest that modern living would lead to disaster. The division into separate squabbling tongues that had been its result was also often evoked to describe multi-ethnic, multicultural modern metropolises like Vienna, Berlin, or New York. The ziggurat Lethaby illustrated was, he emphasized a very real ancient building that could be accurately reconstructed through new fields, archaeology and Assyriology, recovering texts and deciphering ancient languages. But it also evoked mythic analogues which had special relevance to the modern city. Now let us return to Hugh Ferris and his 1929 The Metropolis of Tomorrow, a book which combined his drawings from various projects with analysis of recent trends and predictions for the city of the future. Ferris was an admirer of Lethaby, and I would argue we find a clear tribute in his frontispiece for Metropolis, an unannotated shadowy scene that Ferris titled Buildings Like Mountains, a phrase that echoes two of Lethaby's chapter titles in architecture, pavements like the sea and ceilings like the sky, as well as his concept of the world mountain as a model for sacred structures. For Lethaby, the ultimate building as mountain was the Babylonian ziggurat of Baelis. In effect, then, Ferris takes the same subject as Lethaby for his opening image. Like Lethaby, Ferris explicitly disdained the mere revival of the styles of the past. He made this clear in his illustration, Reversion to Past Styles, a trend that persisted, quote, despite new images inherent in zoning laws, despite new materials, and despite the logical and sometimes impassioned pleas of leaders in modern design. The same conventional forms were still stacked up. Ferris writes that it is his duty to show what would happen if architects continued piling Parthenons upon skyscrapers. So classicism is very out for Ferris. Yet Ferris found in some past examples an ethos to imitate, again hitting notes familiar from Lethaby's work. He explained that the most successful periods of architecture historically, however stylistically varied, were characterized by an approach in which architecture was consciously employed for no less an object than the elevation and evolution of man. In Ferris's metropolis, only one ancient architectural form is evoked as a direct solution for the modern age, as we have already seen the ancient Assyrian ziggurat. May we not for a moment, he wrote, imagine an array of modern ziggurats providing restaurants and theaters on their ascending levels. The ancient Babylonian or Assyrian ziggurat was sacred architecture. Transplanted to American modernity, Ferris imagined the same structure in terms that were better suited to a modern New Yorker's interests. But Ferris's modern ziggurats were not to be mere pleasure palaces. The ziggurat form offered numerous benefits for an urbanism shaped to the psychological and physical needs of its human inhabitants. The already occurring trend for stepped back skyscrapers in one, is one in which, quote, we will note the growing desire for light and air, the increasing realization of the value of direct sunlight, the utilization of terraces, and even the planting thereon of shrubs and trees. In his future city, Ferris imagines an acceleration of this trend with abundant planting and roofs and terraces developed into sun porches and gardens, soil on the roof, and trees cultivated thereon. The ziggurat form was an architecture of health for the human and metropolitan body alike. This idea clearly reflects the influence of classical Greek accounts of the legendary hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world, which was described as a planted and watered terraced structure of the mid-first millennium. While excavations of the city of Babylon and cuneiform sources have failed to discover anything that could be identified with this legend, it continues to inform popular reconstructions of the city and popular imagination of an ancient monumental but also green city. The legendary hanging gardens, like the biblical myth of the Tower of Babel and classical Greek accounts of Babylon's magnificent ziggurat to Baelis, contributed to the image of Babylon as a touchstone for urban construction and the ziggurat planted or not as the ultimate urban monument. 
So, to sum up, for both William Letheby and Hugh Ferris, the mountainous steppe ziggurats stood at the beginning of monumental architecture. While both cautioned against mere derivative borrowing from the past, the ways that the ancients had conceived of building in the distant past could guide modern designers. Furthermore, some of the things that made a ziggurat meaningful in the ancient Middle East, mountainous form, possibilities for access to sun, sky, air, and for growing greenery, were timeless, even especially suited to modern urbanism. While Lethaby and Ferris arrived at the ziggurat form through distinctly modern logic, in each writer's work, it is possible to detect the influence of familiar biblical and classical memories of ancient Mesopotamia as the wellspring of sacred architecture, urbanism, and monumentality. The ziggurat was thus an especially compelling reference point for a new approach to modern architecture that would simultaneously revive something fundamental, radical, and original. wonderful presentation. I'm very glad that this year we expanded our perspective from only the Greek and Roman classical architecture and arts, including also the Egyptian one and the, from the Middle East, so that's, that's wonderful. And uh, now we will listen to the presentation of uh, Maria Wardzinska from the uh, Pałac Saski, um, who is going to present uh, a speech about Platia Town Square or the National Agora, the origins and changes of Piłsudski Square in Warsaw. Thank you very much. I'm really honored that I can be a part of this great conference. Uh, so as Michał said, I would like to present uh, some aspects of uh, a square that is nearby uh, Piłsudski Square in Warsaw. So a town square is a concept uh, that can be analyzed from many different points of view. As an urban space, it's defined as a, uh, as a relatively large undeveloped flat area that is generally accessible and located at the uh, confluence uh, uh, or, or intersection of streets. From a sociologist's perspe perspective, important factors to consider are how to square functions with the community, how it impacts the relation and bond between the users and the various roles it plays. Historians, on the other hand, can utilize uh, squares to limit the area uh, subjects uh, of um, their analysis. Of course, there are perspectives of architects and art historians that um, are uh, really crucial also. In my paper, uh, paper, which focus on a particular space, Piłsudski Square in Warsaw, I will attempt to combine different um, research approaches. On the one hand, I will try to present the history um, that unfolds uh, in this square, and on the other, I will try to demonstrate the impact of social conception uh, and perspe uh, perception and political goals on changes in its appearance. The shaping of today Piłsudski Square can be tracked by to the 7th century. Uh, in, the 19, uh, in the 1630s, a brick palace was constructed by Jerzy Osolinski, the crown councillor uh, at the present day location of Wierzbowa Street. Two decades later, Jan Andrzej Morsten, a renowned Baroque poet, built his uh, palace to the uh, north, to the south of uh, Osolinski um, Palace. This impressive estate uh, was uh, lavishly ador uh, adorned, housing of collections of artistic works within in interiors. At the beginning of the 18th century, the Morstan Palace was acquired by King August II of the Saxon dynasty, becoming the central feature of the unique urban development known as the Saxon Axis. The design of the residence followed the French model with the Entrefort et Jardin la, uh, layout, meaning that it was situated between a courtyard and a garden. The courtyard was uh, structured in a typical uh, fashion for the era, featuring an avant court uh, as the public entrance and leading to the main court, the owner, um, the main court, the owner, the large open ser um, space serving as representative functions. The Saski Palace served as a royal residence until the demise of um, King August III. 
subsequently it was uh, uh, rented out for various purposes, leading to opening the courtyard for public use by citizens on a daily basis. The, layer, uh, the later half of the century was marked by turbulent events in Polish history, including the part uh, partitions of Poland, uh, two armed uprising and the struggles of independence. During this time, the Saski Palace began to um, deteriorate and the role of the former courtyard gradually transformed in the town square. Initially, the, um, initially used for military drills and parades, it's gradually become more accessible to the general public. However, its functions remained limited to the ceremonial parades, shows and gatherings. To these days, it retains its representative role authorized uh, by the current authorities. Following the November uprising, the Saski Palace suffered extensive damage and required costly renovations. As a part of, um, as a part of uh, the post-uprising measures, it was handed over by the municipal administration and the subsequent decision was made to sell the palace to a private investor. However, a crucial condition was imposed. The palace had to be reconstructed in a manner that could create um, an unrestricted passage between Saski Garden and Saski Square. The condi um, condition arose from the series of uh, circumstances. At the time, there was no accessible entrance to the Saski Garden from the eastern side, down on the map you can see on the slide. As, um, uh, and these directions lead towards one of the city's main streets, Krakowskie Przedmieście, when we are now, by the way. Hence, the importance uh, of established and unobstructed passage between the garden, the square, and Krakowskie Przedmieście streets held considerable significance. The improvement in communication and the resulting urban transformation in this particular area were crucial for its development, especially in terms of integ uh, integrating the drill square into the overall urban fabric. Additionally, the ongoing transformation of Saski Garden into an English-style landscape park, which was highly fashionable at the time, further emphasized the importance of this area as a green heart of Warsaw, social scene during the summer months. Um, conversely, Saski Square was gaining uh, prominence uh, as a venue of displaying the authorist power. The Saski Palace, with its uh, outdated baroque style and weathered condition, was no longer de meant de um, desirable for this space. I'd like to introduce um, another aspect uh, and take back to the late 18th century. Around 1790, uh, one of the earliest known projects or concepts of the reconstruction of the Saski Palace emerged. Unfortunately, only a copy of a lost watercolor by Zygmunt Vogel provides evidence of this design. The watercolor depicts a grand square surrounded by buildings in the classical style. The focal point of the composition is a, pro um, is a proposed of reconstruction the Saski Palace. The main structure is adorned with a tall colonnade extending the height of the building. Additionally, it, feature, uh, it features a high balustrade uh, attic and decorative statues. The wings of the palace underwent a transformation with a additional addition of six columns por uh, porticos adorned with uh, pediment. Uh, the south uh, wings facade of the Saski Palace also showcase a series of colonnades. The top, um, the top is all off. The proposal suggests the direction of a column modeled after Triumph Column. This suggests that the watercolor project was part of a comprehensive uh, transformation plan for the entire urban complex of the square. The, object, uh, objectives was to, um, the objective was to monumentalize the entire space, reflecting its new role as a public square with representative function. Another example illustrating plans to connect the garden with the square is Adam Idzikowski's design uh, from 1829. Uh, similar, uh, similar motifs can be observed in this project as well. 
The wings are finished with double colonnade porticos and topped with um, a, a lofty attics ador um, adorned with sculptures. The, the transformation of the mind body is particularly inter uh, interesting. The proposal suggests significantly raising its central part in comparison of the rest of the building. Additionally, a tunnel passage was designed to connect the garden with the square. The facade of the passage is flanked by the six column porticos. Within um, the central part of the square, we again um, uh, encounter a tall column um, adorned with um, a figure, like representing one of the Tsars, probably Nikolai I. Although um, there were valid concepts uh, for transforming a former courtyard Saski Square, uh, former courtyard Saski Square had to wait for its visual transformation until the 1830s. During this period, some of the utility buildings adjacent to the, um, to the palace sorry, uh, were demolished to expand a square space. The circumstances and um, ra uh, realities of that time created an opportunity and necessity to change not only the square's appearance, but also surrounding communication and urban planning of the area. As pre uh, previously mentioned, the palace required reconstruction and the city authorities made the decision to undergo a complete transformation, including the opening of a passage between the garden and the square. However, with, this, um, uh, with the palace being public property, the challenge remained of selecting an uh, appropriate project for its adaptation. The, project of, um, the process of choosing a reconstruction project um, holds architectural um, historical significance. The municipal, um, municipal authorities organized a public auction for the building with the condition that participants must submit an adaptation project for the Saski Palace. Estimate architects of the time participate in this competition and fortunately some, um, some of the preserved projects can be found in the archives. Two projects prepared by Henrik Marconi received the highest evaluation. This project proposed a symmetrical layout of the wings, connected by two variations of colonnade instead, uh, instead of a central main body. The facades showcase a, krill, um, a clear eclecticism, drawing inspiration from classical, Greek, and Roman, as well as Renaissance architectural forms, while maintaining a constant stream of uh, architectural divisions. Another notable project was designed by, by Václav Richel. This design featured, okay, uh, features a relatively simple uh, facade decoration characterized by rhythmic arrangement of windows and pilasters. The central uh, focal point was monumental colonnade um, set atop um, arcades. Um, What's, uh, what set this project apart from another was the facade facing the garden, which was designed in the ro uh, romantic neo-gothic style. It features soaring finals and constructed using red brick. After the series of, um, in, um, of discussions and decisions, the authorities um, um, ultimately selected Richard's project proposed about, by the merchants Barzov. What is interesting, the um, implementation of chosen design was um, entrusted to another uh, architect, Adam Idzikowski, who was mentioned earlier. In conclusion, the overall outcome of the reconstruction uh, demands satisfactory. The square underwent a remarkable transformation highlighted by the addition of a monumental double colonnade in the Ionic style situated on archives. This colonnade served as a connection between two wings that extended from the former palace. The facade of the building adopted a classical style and the garden facing elevation showcased a neo-gothic aesthetic. Mm. A newly renovated building was primarily intended uh, for apartment retail and quick became one of the most sought after, um, after addresses in 19th century Warsaw for the next three decades. However, um, after, after another uprising, 
the Russian army took control of the building, leading uh, us to a new chapter on its history, the military one. Mm. What brings us to another fascinating chapter in, history, uh, in the history of the square? Poland's regaining of independence after 1980. The buildings on the western front ends, frontage uh, were allocated for the need of vital institution in the newly formed state. The Saski Palace was taken over by the general staff of Polish army. This developed uh, serve, uh, served as a catalyst. This development served as a catalyst for the ideal, uh, ideological revel of the square, retaining uh, its significance and adapting it into a new functions. Saski Square became a focal point for Polish patriotic sentiments. Thanks um, to the placement of the tomb of the unknown soldier in the colonnade arcades of the Saski Palace in 1925, and additionally, two years prior, the Prince Józef Poniatowski monument was erected, which deserves another lecture. Um, directing um, the uh, attention back to the square and the project association with it, the intention was to establish a funding for a monument commemorating the fighters for the independence of the homeland. This monument would um, symbolize um, the triumph in the struggle for a free Poland. In late 1924, uh, the monument building committee decided that it should be situated on Saski Square, but however, the concept was beyond um, a mere monument. The square itself was meant to be an, uh, a monument. Uh, hence, the architectural solution were required to maintain its function um, as a site of ceremonies at public gathering. In 1926, the works on um, the works on, on reorganization of the entire square monument and the announcement of competition commenced. The submission um, um, the submission characters. Uh, by classical monumentalism infused by modernistic elements, respected the presence uh, of the Saski Palace and the Tomb of Unknown Soldier, as well as Poniatowski Monument. Once again, architects sought to emphasize uh, significance and importance of the palace, uh, of the place, by drawing inspirations from classics. This approach was evident in the project uh, award first press, which you can see on the slides, but however, Another award project uh, featured buildings that imitated the classical style of the Saski Palace. The, first, uh, the third prize is quite interesting um, a proposal. The side buildings fully enclose the square from the streets. Uh, taking inspiration from the colonnade of Saski Palace, the reed was extended and the columns doubled. The arrangement of arcades on the ground floor following the ABABA pattern was and was it visually complaining. Uh, the central pavilion took the uh, form of Greek temple with a four column portico intended um, uh, to house the tomb of the unknown soldier. On the opposite side, a three arcade triumphal arc was crowned by three sculptures of cannon. Lastly, I, mention, I must, men must mention the work of Paweł Wędziakolski, which personally uh, I like the most. The architects proposed not only transforming the surroundings of the square, but also uh, altering its shapes. The envisioned and uh, elliptical layout reminiscent of St. Peter's Square. Buildings in the front of our um, arches symmetrically, symmetrically enclosed the square from the north and south. Square pavilions topped with domes flanked each other. The entire structure was com uh, complemented by two sculptures depicting Polish national heroes, Kościuszko and Piłsudski. However, a drawback of this project was the massiveness uh, of the new building and the lack of harmony with the surrounding arterias. The mentioned projects demonstrate the tendency to employ the proven classical willingly for monumental and commemorative uh, endeavors, aiming the emphasis of significance of this place. However, no one of these projects were uh, ultimately realized. 
During the Second World War, the Salski Palace fell victim of destruction and was demolished in December 1944. After the war, only a fragment of arcades housing the grave of an unknown soldier was reconstructed. Although discussion regarding the reconstruction of entire complex took place, and un but unfortunately no such rebuilding efforts were undertaken until the early 20s. Without um, deviling into a discussion about the complex, history, um, history surroundings, uh, the concept of rebuilding the Saski Palace, I'm pleased to inform you that this project is presently underway. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a great presentation and at the same time we can treat it as a very good introduction be before our tour and uh, that gives us a lot of things to think about in the meantime and now we will listen to the last panelist uh, Esther uh, Schubert, Schubert. Schubert, uh, who is a PhD candidate in Ötvöslorant University exactly. uh, and is going to present a speech entitled Putti at Work, the new life of an ancient Roman theme in 18th, 20th century architectural sculpture. Thank you very much. I'll just start my timer just to be sure. So, uh, dear all, I uh, live in Budapest and I really like exploring uh, my own city but also other cities I visit by just wandering around and looking for curious, interesting, beautiful details on buildings. And uh, of course, because I studied classical archaeology, I tend to gravitate toward uh, classically inspired details. So this is how I uh, took an interest in uh, the topic of my paper today. Uh, that is, uh, more specifically, children working or uh, engaged in different activities of uh, all kinds of trades representing uh, various occupations. And um, these children, the identity of these children seems to be a divisive uh, problem. In different sources, they get called by different names, uh, cherubs, angels, cupids. I tend to call them putti, uh, but it seems to me that uh, they certainly continue the ancient tradition of amores and psyche uh, pictures. And so, in my paper, I would like to compare the ancient and the later examples, and especially uh, try to explore how the later uh, group uh, adapted and also built upon the, the elements used from ancient art uh, to convey its own uh, messages. Let's start by looking at some ancient examples. From the surviving evidence, it seems that this wasn't uh, really a popular topic in Roman art. We have some marble sarcophagi like this one from the Louvre. Uh, it was uh, the sarcophagus of a centurion, and uh, on the left side we see an armorer's workshop uh, populated by amores, and also on the uh, right side we see the finished uh, arms as well. We have a few gems also, like this one from Munich, or in Munich today, uh, illustrating flower garland makers, but most of these pictures uh, can be found uh, in wall paintings from Pompeii and Herculaneum. Uh, I think the most famous uh, depiction of this subject comes from the Casa dei Vetti in Pompeii, so I chose the goldsmiths to show one of these scenes uh, in de detail to you. On the left side we see two amores working at a larger anvil with uh, pincers and uh, large heavier hammers. Then uh, we have a pair of one standing amor uh, weighing something, we cannot really see what, uh, on a pair of scales. Uh, for a customer maybe, uh, uh, we only sh uh, see that it's a sitting figure wearing a long garb. Then uh, another amor is working at a smaller anvil uh, with a uh, lighter hammer, maybe something more meticulous with uh, precious metals and probably a workbench next to him. And finally, on the right, we have the furnace with uh, the bust of Vulcan on the top and uh, two amores are stoking a fire uh, by blowing air through pipes uh, to the flames. And uh, 
if we look at now uh, the architectural decorations from the 18th to 20th century I'd like to present today, we see really similar elements. So all the necessary tools of the trade, different kinds of techniques, but uh, actually these are the contemporary occupations we see from the 18th to the 20th century. Uh, most of them, uh, at first I, I'd like to uh, say that most of them are reliefs uh, of plaster, stone or ceramics and uh, also sculptures. Uh, I brought uh, one example uh, to show you in, in detail uh, from this group as well. It's uh, one of my absolute favorites from Amsterdam. It's a former cigar uh, shop. It opened in 1881. And on the storefront, we have two panels that form a sequence of uh, continuous scenes uh, that show the whole production process from start to finish. So on the left, we have uh, the, the tobacco harvest. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, it's done by uh, slave children. Uh, they have, uh, uh, they are, they seem to be of African origin because of their hair and facial features. Then the tobacco leaves get packed up in the middle, uh, inspected maybe. Uh, the central figure uh, has uh, the winged cap of Mercury, so uh, a little bit about his presence later. Uh, then the packages get packed on a cart, and on the next panel on the other side, the tobacco arrives uh, from the colonies to the Netherlands, and several children form it down into a gigantic cigar. Then finally, some of them even sample the final product, and an unfortunate little chap in the corner uh, suffers from nasty consequences. Uh, I would like to show just a few more examples to demonstrate the diversity of the occupations represented in these pictures. Um, recently, I found some examples in Poland uh, too. So here is a, a puto from military food warehouse in Kotko with ears of grain behind him and a sickle in his head. Then uh, organ builder from Sangalan library in the monastery. Uh, photographer, a little cherub uh, from Budapest and also some quite determined lumberjacks from the lobby of a lumber company also in Budapest. So as uh, you can see, these uh, later architects or artists uh, did not simply reuse ancient elements, but creatively adapted them. As uh, Professor Cianciolo uh, put it, uh, uh, they reinvented, uh, so to speak, antiquity, uh, or they continued the ancient tradition. Uh, in the next few slides, I try to uh, give an overview of the distribution of these examples, or to be exact, the examples I've uh, found so far, because I have to emphasize uh, my data is most certainly incomplete. Uh, just yesterday, I found out that in this exact building on the ground floor, there is uh, one armorer's workshop scene that's relevant to my uh, research, so I'm quite glad about that. But uh, let me show you this map. I think it demonstrates at least that uh, I found examples all across Europe and also one example uh, in the US, in Washington, DC. But you can see that almost half of my examples are uh, located in Hungary, uh, understandably. If you look at the production dates of uh, these putti depictions, I think we can um, determine uh, or see some trends in their popularity. The very first or earliest one I uh, managed to find is from 19, uh, 1899, sorry. Uh, these reliefs uh, adorn the haberdashers' uh, guild house on the main square of uh, Brussels. So we uh, have some shop scenes and also workshop scenes that are quite familiar by now. But then after nothing much happens until the uh, turn of the 19th century, there we have a, a smaller group, mainly in Vienna and Hungary. And then later after a slower uh, start, uh, they really reach their uh, height of popularity between the 1880s and the 1910s, uh, with a few uh, later examples uh, into the 1920s and maybe 1940s, like this one from Budapest. It's on a building of a former uh, textile manufacturer. 
if we, we would like to list the possible functions and meaning of these uh, images in their own time, I think uh, we have to start by um, saying that they function as advertisement, like kind of trade signs. And um, uh, so they advertised the business or the profession of the owners of these buildings. And at the same time, they were a form of self-representation as well. And the expression of the owner's professional pride. Uh, in one example on the left, we see a relief from the building of a, or the home of a sculptor. And we even see himself, uh, a sculptor himself in the middle. It's not really common among these uh, pictures. Usually we have the initials of the owner included in, in these pictures as well, like uh, on the right, uh, on the building of a furniture manufacturer. But also other symbols allude to the profits and the wealth uh, collected by these uh, tradesmen and other professionals like the presence of mercury, as we have seen earlier uh, in Amsterdam as well, and for example a beehive or a uh, laurel wreath. Uh, at the same time, technological innovations were also a sense of a uh, source of pride. Uh, the technological innovations used in these professions, and they got um, illustrated also in many detail. Like uh, on the top, you can see a, a printing press from London, and in these delightful uh, images um, from Hungary, um, you can see the workings of a telegraph system and also a telephone system with a. Uh, switchboard operator in the middle and, and all other uh, details. On some buildings, uh, a real uh, cohort of these putti are presented with all kinds uh, of different activities and, and uh, occupations like arts, science, agriculture and industry. A perfect example is the Stock Exchange building in Brussels. And uh, this all-encompassing universal approach that shows all different kinds of uh, sources of revenue and, uh, and such, I think, represents uh, economic and cultural progress and the national pride as well in this case. This was a perfect approach also for libraries, as we can see in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Here the artists carved the children uh, engage in activities of late 19th century everyday life. So to conclude my presentation, I think the, uh, the adaptability is a really important factor uh, in the case of this theme. Uh, it's a reason because uh, it's a reason for uh, its long uh, life and uh, uh, quite uh, booming popularity, uh, finally, around the turn of the 20th century. But I think humor was also a quite appealing factor. These uh, clumsy and playful children were a means to entertain the viewer as well. And, oh, sorry. At the same time, the classical character and atmosphere of these scenes also had the capacity to elevate these uh, professions. And uh, so to say, they connected uh, this profession with uh, classical antiquity and gave a mythological background, if you will, to reality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. And uh, uh, yeah, it was also very amusing to see those ancient, ancient motifs incorporated in modern tasks. So this was our last presentation for this panel. So this is the time for discussion, which we're going to uh, begin now. Uh, who, would like to, who would like to start with a question? Okay, I have a question to Ashtar. Um, uh, about the motif uh, of working putti in ancient art uh, because you saw you have uh, shown uh, us uh, the motif from the roman times but i am wondering if it was uh, in the hellenistic arc, arc maybe do you know some examples from from there 
that no, time? No, I, I don't yet um, know any Hellenistic examples. I've uh, read about uh, the examples in wall painting, and uh, the article said that uh, most of them are in the fourth style uh, of Pompeian wall paintings, but there are also examples from the third style. But I cannot uh, tr track it back any further than that. Of course, the, the really young children like uh, uh, Amor figures uh, originate in Hellenistic times, but these workshop scenes I, I haven't really seen in Hellenistic times. But I, uh, I forgot to mention that I would really welcome any comments or suggestions if you know any more uh, examples I, I do not know about yet. <laughs> Uh, and if, if I may, I have a second question. Uh, did the, uh, uh, I suppose you know the François Duquesnois, uh, the ma maker of putti in the 17th uh, century. Um, and maybe he did, uh, maybe it's a tip for you. Uh, maybe he did uh, some of these uh, motifs with the working putti because he was the source of the inspiration for the uh, many artists uh, follow in following uh, centuries, maybe. Yes, I am uh, also trying to figure this one out. So how uh, this motif got uh, transferred through the centuries because it's many, many centuries and, and um, these pictures began like more than a thousand years later than the ancient Roman ones. So I have a few uh, pointers and theories about this, but I uh, um, did not focus on this one uh, in this paper. I think uh, most definitely this uh, connection was not uh, direct in every um, occasion. So maybe the, the artists may have seen some ancient examples, but I think also uh, Renaissance uh, etchings and uh, later Baroque and Rococo etchings and uh, paintings must have also been a source of these uh, pictures, I think, because in some reliefs I found uh, direct uh, quotes, so to uh, say, uh, from Rococo sculpture, uh, like a, a figure who gets his hand uh, pinched by a crab, and I found uh, an exact example of that in Rococo sculpture, so I think uh, it rather an indirect connection, and I think it's uh, a quite varied one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. Um, <coughs> is playing music work? Yeah, I know, right. I'm, I I'm haven't had uh, time to figure out these ones because I only <laughs> saw them yesterday at the first time, for the first time. Uh, the ones on the ground floor are easier because they are uh, obviously working in a workshop on some shields or something. Uh, I saw like slavers on that scene, I'm not sure, and then and playing music. Uh, we also have a music academy in Budapest where uh, such scenes are uh, present and they are of course playing music. I think I would, um, I, I have sometimes a little bit of problem by uh, uh, with categori categorizing these depictions because uh, some reliefs and uh, statues are on the margin for me, like I, I'm trying to work on the definition uh, still, but I think if uh, there is a more obvious connection to the profession of uh, the owner of the building or the purpose of a public building like the Music Academy, I think I would uh, much more say that it's in my uh, subject than if it's not. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, many questions for all of you, but I start with the putti. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think you could have a look at Palermo case study, Serpotta, in especially if you are interested in the relationship between putti and architecture and space, architectural space, because they completely cover the walls of uh, churches, especially one of the oratory, and also, they are early examples of putti. I don't know if uh, we can say at work because they are like actors. They imitate the, what happens in some other. In this is all stucco as a material. 
So it's interesting because they act like adults in very so interesting, do you know this case? I'm not sure about it. Uh, I will write it down and, and look at that. Okay, I can send the you the, just the, um, the references that would because be great. it could be interesting, especially in the relationship with architecture because they are absolutely protagonists of the space. Thank they you very much. They create the space. I will look and into uh, it. And they also act in a very strange way, like, uh, like actors. They imitate uh, with humor, very funny or very sad or very sad. They like they are like a comment of what happens in the world like they comment the war they comment the re religious scenes mm. probably could be interesting for you yes definitely thank <laughs> you very much thank you i have also i try to be uh, concise i have a question for uh, maria um, I'm very fascinated by this topic you mentioned which is huge of course spolia fragments um, readaptation of these elements and you mentioned that there are many ways and I wanted to ask you if you apart from the ecological or recycling for um, lack of resources of these materials in addition to the aesthetical use of uh, spolia I know that there is an example with the Norman architecture in Sicily uh, like medieval that this is mainly a political use. It's uh, aesthetic, of course, for sure not ma uh, lack of resources, because in the most expensive churches covered with Byzantine mosaics, with the best artists of the Mediterranean, they recycle columns. Every column is different, in size, in uh, material, in, and this is just a display of power, is a do um, like a, an architectural domination through the incorporate, in, incorporating these elements means dominating. And if in Rome or in the field you study, you find this political use of spolia. This is my main question. It's, it's highly interesting. I, I think it's political from the very first instance, instances at the time of Constantine. Uh, the Arch of Constantine in Rome is highly political because it's an integration of reliefs uh, associated with former emperors. So he takes on in his triumphal arch the, the authority of the previous em emperors and he, he even ha has their portraits recarved to look like himself and things like that. Or for instance, Charlemagne in the, around, 18, uh, around the, uh, in the 8th century who imports columns from Ravenna to Aachen in order to uh, transport the, the power of the empire to northern France. There are all sorts of, of political uh, ideologies that is highly interesting. Excellent. And that also confirms that it's not only about economy and lack exactly. of... Exactly. Uh, and uh, there is an interesting article about a scholar, Jeremy Jones, that writes about diversity by design that in this uh, medieval architecture in Sicily, this diversity is not just something that the kings found in Sicily and used, like they use what they have. This diversity was uh, the goal, and the diversity come from a deliberate uh, acquisition and uh, incorporation of very different elements in order to make it more rich, more complex, so the idea of diversity by design, so an, a diversity which is the result, not what they found by coincidence in the country, but what they import. So yes. that's an addition. Will you send me the reference of that article? Sure, yes, yes. I will. <laughs> and I'll keep the microphone if, if that's okay. I have, I, a I have another question, oh. but maybe later. I have a question for, for Esther or some comments perhaps. Uh, I think there's a whole vast field of putty uh, engaged in what could be called the liberal arts, that would be music or, or whatever, but perhaps it would be productive to make a distinction in the new industrial um, technologies of the 19th century, because the, the liberal arts is like, like uh, astronomy or music or whatever, is 
already there, but what is new in your material is that they, also, they are engaged in what we would call the age of industrialization. Yes. So it's a good idea to, to perhaps divide this kind of uh, fabrication, manufacturing thing from the, the liberal arts. Yes, I absolutely uh, see your point. I'm um, thinking about this myself because there are some examples where only the, um, for example, the fine arts or liberal arts are depicted. And uh, the, my, my problem is uh, that in some cases, like on Stock Exchange building of Brussels, uh, these get mixed up with the production scenes and the agricultural scenes. Uh, and uh, for example, in the Library of Congress, the fine arts and also the performing arts are uh, represented together with all the more mundane uh, daily pursuits like fishing or uh, hunting. On, um, so they are put in an equal footing, so to speak. I think maybe there are examples uh, for a kind of situation uh, uh, as you, uh, you are telling. And then I think on some buildings, these get mixed uh, together. So I, I'm trying to uh, distinguish b between these uh, different subtypes. And it's really, a, I think, a vast material. Uh, but uh, it's a really useful point, and thank you for this. Allow me yes. for two more brief comments. <laughs> Um, I worked on grotesques of the 16th century fresco painting, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of putti also in painting that you may use. Uh, I have uh, I wrote a book with with nice details that you can look at if you want Thank more you. examples. But then uh, a last comment: it struck me that when we look at your examples with tobacco production or whatever. Mm -hmm. We, are, we find them amusing and we find there's a kind of clash between the traditional, the ancient tradition of putti and the modern uh, industrial manufacture. But at the time, they probably didn't find that kind yes. of clash. They weren't. I don't so, when, so we yeah. when we find it humorous today, it's actually a kind of estrangement or alienation to the classical tradition and it has been much more um, self-evident for them to integrate the putti in, in their own uh, uh, tasks that were of, of their own yes. contemporary uh, daily life. Yes, I agree. I don't think that they had this character even in already in antiquity. Uh, this just got updated to a humor that we more easily understand, maybe. Thank you very much. Okay, there are no. <laughs> I have a question for Eva. Very interesting and very fascinating. Uh, this uh, reuse and interpretation of the arche archetypical form of the ziggurat. I was wondering uh, what about the mm, Mexican or uh, Central American examples? Do they play a role? Because I was thinking mm, Frank Lloyd Wright was very impressed by this uh, culture. So which is also very archetypical. And if you also find something, not only about Babylonia, but also about another um, part of the world where this is something very powerful and present. Yeah, that's something that, um, that I'm very interested in, actually. Um, in like the, particularly in the 20s when you have like, uh, a style that you can call Mayan revival or Aztec revival that becomes quite popular in the US. It has a lot of aesthetic overlaps with Assyrian revival, um, including and in sort of reusing these step pyramid forms. Um, there's a guy I, I think called Francisco Mujica, who's a uh, Mexican American um, architect who works in both Mexico and the US, who uh, writes a book in the early 20th century about. Uh, the coherences between the skyscraper and the stepped pyramids of Mesoamerica as this uniquely American form of architecture. So he's making the same sort of arguments, but rooting it all in this long American tradition. Um, and I think he, he does connect that to some direct relationship between the Middle East and Mesoamerica, um, which is also this sort of uh, hyper diffusionist theory that that's usually at the fringes of, of, of um, respectability. Um, but 
it, he interests me a lot because of how he's saying the same things that Hugh Ferris is saying about the skyscraper as this distinctly American form that's like emerging on this new continent. But for him, it's a n like North and South American form, uh, and it has like a rootedness in the soil. Yeah. Is there any other question that you would like to ask someone? I don't see, so maybe I'll take advantage and ask them. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, can I ask you, Maria? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm sorry because I'm not very, yeah, this, this Maria. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not very familiar, let's say, with the history of the, of the uh, Saxon palace, and I'm wondering about the perception of it during the, uh, in a period of the Russian domination, it's especially when there was this military, uh, when, when they dominated the space and then they also built the, uh, Orthodox Church, and I'm, I'm I'm wondering about the perception of the space from the point of view of the local community, and I mean the, the Polish community. What was the approach? Did they, I don't know, avoid the space, or was it indifferent? Um, yeah. So yeah, the truth is I skipped this uh, part of the history in, in my uh, speech. I did it. Um, uh, because it will be too long <laughs> to be true. Um, yeah, there is a discussion about um, this perception and there are arguments that um, even that it was um, a, a Russian architect, which is not true. Um, anyway, uh, the fact is that the Saski Palace, um, even during the Russian occupation, especially mi military occupation of itself, uh, still was the uh, m may the object in the city which was uh, um, very popular to, to uh, very popular. The people would go there, make photos. Uh, it was also popular over the postcards. So uh, m this um, uh, this, what can we say about the Russian um, Russian time uh, at the end of the 19th century? Uh, m more effectively, um, more effective was this uh, building of the Orthodox Church in the center of the Saski Square, than uh, than the Saski Palace, even with um, with the officers in it. So Saski Palace never was um, uh, in the perception uh, of the people of that time as a Russian building, uh, but the, the square itself, yes, because of this uh, Orthodox Church and former, uh, former monument uh, made by Korazzi. Thank you, yeah, thank you. Um, so is there anyone else? Who one, just one little <laughs> question. You use the term Agora, and it is something that, what makes this square an Agora? The uh, columns, the fact that this is a meeting place, mm -hmm. what is Agora? Uh, I think that um, in the last part of existence, this square in the, uh, before the Second World War as a square itself with, with all, of the, uh, um, all of the buildings, uh, it was a national agora because um, of its function. It was absolutely official uh, used, but also um, uh, used by people to manifest there, to uh, gathering there uh, for many different uh, occasions. Of course, national, um, national um, uh, holidays, sorry. <laughs> Uh, were the main uh, main course, but uh, uh, but also another manifestations uh, patriotic, but not only. Uh, so that was really a central square uh, for Warsaw during that time, and now still is used that way. Uh, but as you see um, now, it's just an empty space. Belonging to the Roman Catholic, so it's 
then you probably have the last which are the meaning that is identical to what you did before so it's it's not just a moment mm -hmm. so uh, it, yeah i think that this function itself um, and used by by the uh, officials but also also the um, uh, the citizens uh, of war so uh, mm, make this uh, this square uh, that could be named by uh, national agora Anyone else? No, okay. Uh, thank you very much, all of the participants. Unfortunately, we will have to finish now our proceedings. Unfortunately, because they were so, so interesting. And uh, I don't know if you have the same impression, but I have the impression that very often during the scientific conferences, the topics, the variety of topics is so great that they just miss each other and you listen to them and you have no idea what you listen to. And during our conference, I had a totally different, um, uh, not experience, impression, yeah, exactly. Um, and, 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 I'm, and I'm having this, this impression right now that my head is like full of ideas which I find very, very inspirational for, the, for my own research. And that's, that's really great. I want to thank you very much. And I hope that you have the similar impression. I really hope uh, that you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much for all your um, uh, effort and uh, all your presentations. And now it's um, 3.30. So we uh, finish the proceedings here, and at four we're going to uh, to walk to the uh, for a tour. So I think we can gather at four downstairs uh, in front of the entrance to the palace, and um, let's say we have like half an hour. Is it is it fine that we will have half an hour to rest to use the to to use the bathroom, etc., and uh, we will meet downstairs take a photo uh, to, to conclude the, the second day. And uh, then we will go to the, mm, uh, for a tour. And the last announcement is about the, uh, the meeting at the gallery uh, in the evening. I don't know, I, I hope that everyone got the message. If not, uh, I will repeat it here and we are going to meet at 7 p.m. at the uh, Wall Space Gallery and the address is uh, Foxal Street 15, I think, yes. Very good, and there we will have the other occasion to continue the, the, the conversation. Thank you very much once again. <laughs>